At the time I'm making this video, the active NBA legend Kevin Durant just went viral with a quote regarding his standing among the all-time greats. On the suggestion that KD wasn't in the GOAT conversation, he responded by saying, because I went to Golden State? Why shouldn't I be in that? That's the question you should ask. Why not? What haven't I done? Now since KD asked this question, social media has been in a frenzy. For the most part, he's getting roasted, but there's still quite a few people who actually support him in this instance, and think that he belongs in the conversation. Now I will say, one of the things I definitely think KD belongs in the conversation of is the title of the most indefensible player in NBA history. I don't think he necessarily deserves that title more than anyone else. But as a 7-foot sniper who can handle the ball, who has ball handling skills, and who can score from just about anywhere on the court, he certainly has a legitimate argument. But being labeled the greatest player of all time is something else entirely. Let me honor Kevin Durant's take by answering his question in the way he presented it. What hasn't Kevin Durant done? Well, let's look at his resume. He's an NBA champion, he was the Rookie of the Year, he's been a Finals MVP, he's been a League MVP, he's been a Scoring Champion, and he's been an All-Star MVP and most of these honors he's achieved multiple times. When you look at his career, there really isn't much that he hasn't done. I mean, sure, he was never the Defensive Player of the Year, but many guys in the GOAT conversation haven't done that either. So that shouldn't necessarily disqualify him. He's never earned a single All-Defense Team selection, and that certainly hurts. But Magic Johnson and Steph Curry haven't done that either and that hasn't stopped them from entering into that conversation. So just what is it exactly? Is it truly just our bitterness about the fact that he joined the Golden State Warriors? Personally, I don't think so. For me, the one thing that every GOAT candidate has that KD doesn't is that they each overcame some sort of truly massive obstacle in order to win a championship. Magic Johnson had to play out of position as a rookie and defeated an amazing 76ers team while Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was hurt. Michael Jordan finally broke through the bad boy Detroit Pistons and defeated his rival on the way to starting his dynasty. LeBron James overcame a 3-1 deficit in the finals and defeated the greatest regular season team in NBA history while leading both teams in all five stat categories. Kobe Bryant defeated a Hall of Fame loaded Boston Celtics team while he was playing with a broken index finger on his shooting hand, which secured his fifth championship. Despite being written off for his age, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar showed up at the age of 38 and became the oldest finals MVP in NBA history as he led his Lakers to defeat the rivaled Boston Celtics. Bill Russell went to a Game 7 10 times, which in some cases, they were the underdogs, and all 10 times, he won, which was a massive part of his 11 championship ranks. I could keep going, but you get the point. In order to enter that conversation, you have to overcome something incredible, even when the odds were stacked against you. And my question is, when has Kevin Durant ever done that? When he joined the 73-9 Warriors who had just beaten him, and who he had just blown a 3-1 series lead to, they were not only expected to win the championship, but it was basically seen as a foregone conclusion. When that happened, I felt so confident that the Warriors were going to win that I literally congratulated them for winning the 2017 championship the day they signed Kevin Durant in 2016. And outside of that, he hasn't won a championship before or since. So again, when has Kevin Durant overcome something massive to win a championship? I don't think he ever has. And for me, that's his missing piece to entering the conversation of this very exclusive club. It's a conversation that he theoretically could still enter, but again, that would involve him winning it somewhere else. And that window is closing, and it's closing fast. Moments. Moments have defined players' legacies for as long as the NBA has existed, and no moments are more significant than the ones that take place in the NBA Finals. Whether for the better or for the worse, the way these legendary players performed on the game's biggest stage ultimately defined how they were remembered for decades to come. 
With this in mind, there have been many NBA Finals performances that have been crucial to that specific player's legacy. For example, Allen Iverson's iconic Game 1 performance in the NBA Finals where he beat the previously undefeated Los Angeles Lakers, sealing the deal with his pull-up jumper and with his famous step-over of Tyron Lue. Without this game and without this moment, the way we view the legacy of Allen Iverson changes quite dramatically. Other examples would be Kobe Bryant's fifth ring, LeBron James's third ring, and Jerry West's first. Let me first elaborate on Kobe Bryant's fifth. Sure, the Mamba had already won four championship rings heading into the 2010 season, but three of those were with Shaq as the lead star, and the fourth was an easier ring due to Kevin Garnett's season-ending knee injury, which otherwise would have likely resulted in an NBA Finals rematch between the Lakers and the Celtics in 2009. If Kobe lost to the Celtics when he played them again in 2010, then it would have been an 0-2 Finals record against their historic rivals, and the Mamba wouldn't have a championship ring where he was clearly the team's best player and where the Lakers didn't have an easier road to the championship. Not to mention how Kobe's four rings would have left him just short of Magic Johnson's total of five, which would almost certainly eliminate Kobe from consideration of the greatest Laker of all time. Then there's LeBron's ring in 2016. Without this championship over the 73-9 Warriors, look at what he accomplished. He won two championships in four years on a stacked Miami Heat super team, where even LeBron himself had previously predicted at least eight championships. Then there's the ring in 2020, which was accomplished in the Florida bubble after a huge delay due to the pandemic. And to this day, many people refer to this ring as the Mickey Mouse Championship, trying to invalidate its legitimacy. Without the championship over the highly favored Warriors, LeBron's accomplishments are all basically seen as easy road achievements, and he's almost certainly not in the greatest of all time conversation without this legacy defining moment. Then there's Jerry West's first and only championship ring in 1972. The logo is also remembered by another nickname, Mr. Clutch. But if he finished with a tragically winless 8-0 finals record, it's honestly debatable whether or not anyone would still use that nickname today. Although he was never able to lead his Lakers past the superior Boston Celtics, he did end up finally redeeming his legacy a bit when his all-time great 1972 Lakers defeated the New York Knicks in the finals. Obviously, without this lone championship ring, West would inevitably have more damning narratives about his career as a player. But even with all of these crucial rings considered, I still believe that there's one that stands above them as the most important ring to a player's legacy of all time, and that is Dirk Nowitzki's lone championship ring in 2011. With this ring on his resume, Dirk is viewed today as a Dallas legend and as one of the greatest power forwards of all time, and as the man who conquered a super team when no one expected him to. But what if I told you that without this ring, he would be viewed as a failure, as a choker, and as one of the most underwhelming talents of basketball history? Sounds a bit drastic? Well, I have the memory and the context to explain to you why it's not. Heading into the 2010-2011 season, the perception of Dirk Nowitzki and his legacy was in a much different place. Although younger basketball fans may not know this, the vast majority of Dirk's career was riddled with high expectations followed by disappointment. One of the biggest examples was when Nowitzki and the Mavericks blew a 2-0 series lead to the Miami Heat in the 2006 NBA Finals. Dirk's underwhelming performance was a big reason why they lost the next four games straight, as he shot 38.7% from the field during that stretch and an ugly 22.2% from three-point range. Another massive example was when Dirk Nowitzki's Mavericks finished with a franchise record 67 wins at the end of the 2007 regular season. Heading into the playoffs, they seemed poised for revenge, and as if they were ready to win the championship that they thought they should have won the previous season. But then, they were stunningly upset in the first round of the playoffs by the 8th seeded Golden State Warriors, a Warriors team that finished with 25 less wins throughout the regular season, making it one of the biggest upsets of NBA history. Once again, Nowitzki's terrible inefficiency certainly didn't help, as he shot only 38.3% over the course of the series and a terrible 21.1% from three-point range. This came after he wrapped up his MVP campaign for the regular season, which made his drop-off even more painful. 
These two are obviously the biggest and most memorable examples of Nowitzki's team's disappointing, but it's also far from the only times it happened. Heading into the 2011 playoffs, the Mavericks had won at least 50 games for the past 11 seasons straight, and three of those were 60-win seasons. Yet despite all of that regular season success, they had never won the NBA championship. That is a long trend of giving your fan base high expectations just to end up disappointing them. Most of those disappointments were tied to their often subpar defense in the postseason, which even earned them the nickname the Alice Mavericks due to the fact that they had no D. And defensive prowess certainly wasn't something that Nowitzki was known for either. It got to a point that no matter how well Dirk and the Mavericks did in the regular season, we all expected them to disappoint in the postseason. Why? because that's what they always did. That was their track record, and that was their reputation. There was absolutely no reason to expect otherwise, because when we had in the past, they just made a fool out of us over and over again. Heading into the 2011 playoffs, Dirk was a 32-year-old 7-footer, who was clearly beginning to slow down athletically. So honestly, this was one of the times that we least expected him to deliver. But we all remember what actually happened. They began by eliminating a solid Trailblazers team in six games. Then they swept the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers in the second round. Then they defeated a much younger Oklahoma City Thunder team in the conference finals. And then, as the biggest stunner of them all, Dirk and the Mavericks defeated the Big Three's Miami Heat in six games. If it wasn't for this incredible run, Dirk's playoff resume essentially has nothing worth bragging about. He would have been sitting around the top of the list of the greatest talents to never win a championship, and he would be seen as one of the biggest chokers of playoff history. This championship ring literally changed everything for Nowitzki, even to the point that many young fans today don't even realize that this terrible legacy was a very realistic possibility that was just narrowly avoided. I'm not even suggesting that this was a fair and accurate way to view Dirk Nowitzki at this point in his career, because when all things are considered, you realize that he didn't have a tremendous amount of superstar support throughout the vast majority of his prime years. But, regardless of whether or not it was fair for him to be viewed as a choker, by and large, that was the reality of how he was viewed pre-2011 finals. So I've been an NBA fan for a long time, and I've seen trends come and go. In some ways, I've seen the quality of the sport increase over the years, and in other ways, I've seen it decrease. Based on the NBA product that I'm witnessing currently, I'm making my predictions on some of the things we'll see over the next 10 years. And let me know in the comments what are some of your predictions as well. First off, someone is outscoring Kobe Bryant's 81-point game in 2006. One of the reasons I believe this is because modern players hold Kobe in such a high regard. They have tremendous respect and reverence for the Mamba, to the point that many of them are constantly drawing parallels between themselves and the Lakers legend. With that being considered, you just know that several of these guys would absolutely love to surpass the Mamba's historic night if given the opportunity. For goodness sake, just last season, Donovan Mitchell scored 71 points in a regular season game. But what many people don't realize is that he only scored 16 points in the first half. He wasn't even the game's leading scorer after the first two quarters. If his first half wasn't so pedestrian, then he likely would have outscored Kobe's legendary performance on that very evening. But here's my strongest point. We are seeing a lot of offense in recent history, which is the major reason why I'm making this prediction. In the current NBA, teams are averaging north of 114 points per game, which is the highest average since Wilt Chamberlain played basketball in 1970. When Kobe dropped 81 points in the 05-06 season, teams were averaging only 97 points per game. That doesn't quite tell the whole story though. Players are having explosive offensive performances twice as often as they were when Kobe scored 81. Now that statement might sound hyperbolic to some of you, but I promise that it's not. In basically every way you look at it, there is now double the amount of offensive explosions. In the 05-06 season, a total of three players averaged at least 30 points per game. And in the 2022-2023 season, there was a total of six players. 
In the 05-06 season, six different players scored at least 50 points, for a total of 12 50-point games. And last season, 14 different players scored at least 50 points, with a total of 25 games. In 05-06, there were two games with at least 60 points, and both of them were Kobe Bryant. In 2022-2023, there were four games where a player scored at least 60 points, and two of them were 70-point games. As you guys can see from the evidence, the frequency in which players are offensively erupting has rapidly increased. And because of this, I see it as only a matter of time before someone breaks Kobe's record as the highest scoring performance since the NBA merger. Piggybacking off of my last point is my next prediction. Michael Jordan's record of 63 points in a single playoff game will be surpassed. Honestly, I'm kind of stunned that this record is still somehow standing nearly four decades later. Not only has offense been rapidly inflating over the last 10 years, but it still blows my mind that the highest scoring performance in playoff history took place against a number one ranked defense without making a single three-point shot. Surely at some point, a star is gonna torch a seventh or eighth seed to break that record. Here's another crazy thing to consider. In the last 10 years, there have been 16 50-point games in the playoffs, yet none of them have reached 60. But I don't think that will be the case for much longer. With scoring at a modern high, and with the volume of 3-point attempts being at an all-time high as well, surely some star is gonna get ridiculously hot from 3-point distance and finally break this iconic record. Next up is a prediction about the Spurs rookie star, Victor Wembenyama. In my opinion, Victor will be the next player to achieve the incredibly rare feat of a quadruple double. Obviously, Wemby is a 7 foot 4 inch alien who can be incredibly dominant in many ways on the court simultaneously, thanks to his insane combination of size, length, and agility. At the time I'm making this video, Victor is 19 years old and is only 19 games into his NBA career, yet he's already displayed some of his triple-double and quadruple-double potential. In his 13th game in the league, he finished with 19 points, 13 rebounds, 4 assists, and 8 blocks. In his 17th game, he put up 22 points, 11 rebounds, 6 steals, and 4 blocks. Currently, he leads the entire NBA in block shots per game, and he's third among seven footers in steals per game. In this sense, he actually reminds me of Akeem Olajuwon, as both players could lead a game on any given night in points, rebounds, assists, steals, or blocks. Again, he's still a teenager who's not even one third into his rookie season, yet we're already seeing the potential of a statistically historic showing. Just imagine the kind of stat lines he'll be putting up with another 7 years of experience and maturation. As things currently stand, only 4 players in NBA history have ever officially achieved the quadruple double, and they are Nate Thurmond, Alvin Robertson, Hakeem Olajuwon, and David Robinson. Within the next 10 years, I believe Victor will be the 5th. And now, for my most upsetting prediction. I don't believe that Steph Curry, LeBron James, or Kevin Durant will win another championship ring before they retire. The NBA is insanely talented nowadays, and having a super team doesn't carry as much weight as it once did, seeing how most teams have 2-3 legitimate superstars on their roster. LeBron is 38 years old, Steph is 35, and Kevin Durant is 35 as well. Not only is the clock ticking on their days as a top tier player, but currently, none of their teams are performing up to the level that they hoped they would be heading into the 2023-2024 season. There have been very few instances where a player was at least 35 years old and has led his team to a championship as the best player on his team. As of now, the list is basically Michael Jordan and LeBron James. And that's about it. Expecting these players to do this in this extremely competitive modern league isn't just wishful thinking, but it's historically unlikely. Honestly, I could probably give a lot more predictions about the course of the NBA over the next 10 years, but I think I'll save some of those for future videos. Hopefully, 10 years from now, I'll still be doing this YouTube thing, 
and we'll be able to look back and see how stupid or genius I was for these predictions. So I gotta be real with you guys. I already know today's video is going to be extremely triggering to a large demographic of my audience. For the most part, I don't consider myself an NBA YouTuber, but an NBA history YouTuber. My specialty is covering eras from generations past. I choose to cover these past eras more than the modern era, not because I'm biased towards older basketball, and not because those eras contain some of my favorite players. The reason I do it is because I believe it's the best thing I have to offer. Most YouTubers who cover this sport are much younger than me and haven't been watching the game as long, which naturally means that the modern coverage of the NBA is way more saturated. With each video I upload, I hope that there is something new that the audience can learn from it. If you watch my video and you discover something new and interesting about the game of basketball, then I believe I'm doing my job well. This is why I disproportionately talk about the past generations more. With this being the case, my average viewer tends to be much older than the average basketball viewer. You fellow old heads are the lifeblood of my channel. I am eternally grateful for you guys, because I know for a fact that my channel wouldn't be nearly as successful if it wasn't for you guys consistently tuning in. With that being said, I tried to be as impartial as possible with my basketball opinions. So because of that, I have to risk pissing some of you off today. As the title of this video indicates, I firmly believe that this modern era is the most overall talented league in the history of the NBA. For a while, I debated between several different eras. The NBA around 1988, around 1992, and around the early 2000s were ridiculously dense with superstar talent. And maybe in a future video, I'll break down the comparisons even more. But as of now, 2023 stands on top. There's several reasons for this. The first major reason is because there's a tremendous amount of talent league-wide with more teams. Throughout the decade of the 1960s, there was usually about 8 to 12 teams in the entire league. Although the late 1980s were extremely rich in depth, there was still only 20 to 24 teams in the league. The late 90s of the NBA are often referred to as the expansion era because there were numerous teams being added to the competition during those years. If we're being honest, it took a while for the talent in the league to catch up with the amount of teams it had. Whenever teams are added, the talent pool immediately becomes less concentrated, naturally diminishing formidability of the average NBA team. With the league comfortably sitting at 30 teams since the year 2004, there has been plenty of time for the sport to acquire worldwide talent to fit the amount of franchises. Now my second major reason why this is the most talented era ever is because the rest of the world is better at the game of basketball than they've ever been before, and those top tier international players almost all represent the NBA. With guys in the league like Giannis, Luka, Jokic, and Embiid, this is probably the first era in NBA history that the top five players in the league were mostly made up of international players. It's not just the foreign superstars though, but from the top to the bottom of NBA rosters, we're seeing more capable role players from all over the world. And it's because on a global scale, the popularity of the game is growing at a rapid rate. No, it's not that the American talent has dropped off, but it's that the international talent has caught up. And some would even suggest that it has surpassed the US in talent. Along with the international talent in the NBA, the Olympic and the FIBA USA teams have been progressively finding it harder and harder to win gold medals throughout the decades. Obviously, it would help the Red, White, and Blue's chances if they always put their best foot forward and send out the A-team for these international competitions. But regardless, the days of the US being able to cruise to a gold medal with simply the B-team are long behind us. The third reason why this is the most talented era ever is because in reality, there's several different eras packed into it. For those of you who are old enough, remember those old Energizer battery commercials where the Energizer bunny was powered by their batteries up against the generic competitors? And the bunny would always win, because it just kept going and going and going? Well, the modern athlete is the Energizer bunny. 
This isn't just my opinion, but statistically, this is an objective fact. Of the first round of the 1970 NBA draft, the players selected played for an average of 6.4 years. From the 1980 draft, they played for an average of 7 years. From 1990, they played for an average of 8.4 years. And from the 2000 draft, they played for an average of 9 years. Now obviously, I can't gather the data from a decade later, because many of those players are still playing but I guarantee you that it will be another significant jump. Not just in the NBA, but in basically every sport, athletes are lasting longer than ever before. You have a guy like LeBron James, who's in his 21st season in the NBA and is still considered by many as a top 10 player. Guys like Steph Curry and Kevin Durant are quickly approaching their late 30s and are considered by many to be top five players in the league. These guys are just additional superstars to the guys who are in their early 30s and their 20s. If we're looking at NBA history as an indicator, players like LeBron, Steph, and Durant are not supposed to be among the top 10 players in this era. Some of these guys were in the best player conversation in the 2000s. I'm not sure all of you guys are getting my point, so let me put it this way. Guys like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Isaiah Thomas dominated the 1980s, but on average, their careers only lasted about 11 to 13 seasons. Now imagine if these legends remained among the best players in the NBA until their late 30s. If that was the case, the mid to late 1990s would have been absurdly packed with talent at the top. Envision a league with a prime Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, David Robinson, Shaquille O'Neal, Grant Hill, Penny Hardaway, Patrick Ewing, and then you throw in Magic, Bird, and Isaiah pretty damn close to their peaks. If that hypothetical league blows your mind, then you should begin to understand my point. That is exactly the kind of league we're in today. Now as far as the reasons for this, those are debatable. Some will give the credit to modern medicine. Some will give the credit to advanced technology and training methods. Some will give credit to the better shoes and the private planes. Hell, some will even go as far as crediting the load management. And some, with the more spicy takes, might suggest that it's because all of the designer drugs that the league isn't tracking. Whatever the main culprit is, it's simply undeniable players are finding ways to extend their primes well beyond what is the typical standard of basketball history. And due to this, we now have this wild league, where players from the 2003 draft class, the 2013 draft class, and the 2023 draft class are all fighting for basketball supremacy. Whether it's the toughest league or the most entertaining league are different conversations entirely that we'll simply have to wait for a future video. But as far as the most talented era of basketball history, we're living it, and it's getting to the point where it won't even be all that close. So we've had some time to sit and ponder the NBA's official list of the 75 greatest players of all time. Although new two lists are alike, there are certainly some glaring omissions from this list that the basketball community seems to agree upon. I'll have some of those on this list for sure, but I may also have some other players you hadn't thought of. As you guys requested, here's the most disrespectful snubs from the 75 greatest list. First, what seems to be the most popular choice, Dwight Howard. Whether you're looking at peak performance or complete body of work, Dwight certainly deserves to be on the list and is definitely more accomplished than current players like Anthony Davis and Damian Lillard. Quite frankly, his resume is stacked as he's an NBA champion, made eight All-NBA teams, five All-Defense teams, has five rebounding titles, two blocks titles, and won three straight Defensive Player of the Year awards, which trails only Ben Wallace and Dikembe Mutombo on the all-time list. You could even argue that guys like Ben Wallace and Dikembe Mutombo should have made the list because of their dominant defense, but those guys also didn't have a strong presence on the offensive end. But you can't say that about Dwight Howard, who was constantly averaging north of 20 points per game during his prime. Once upon a time, ESPN even went as far as ranking Howard as the second best player in the NBA. Now like Kobe Bryant once said, I do think ESPN is full of idiots. But this second ranking specifically wasn't that far-fetched during Howard's prime. 
No matter how you look at it, he deserves to be ahead of some other players on this list, and I think this snub specifically will go down as the 75s version of the 50s Dominique Wilkins. Alonzo Mourning. I rarely hear his name get brought up, but I've been pushing him a lot lately, and for good reason. Mourning is one of the most underrated greats of all time, and was one of the fiercest defensive players. Sure, he seems like a player from an era who would be more suited to be selected in the original 50, but he actually accomplished a lot after the 50 Greatest Ceremony, including two Defensive Player of the Year awards and an NBA championship to go along with his seven All-Star selections and two blocks titles. Similar to Dwight Howard, not only was Mourning a dominant defensive player, but in his prime, he was often his team's leading scorer, averaging north of 20 points per game. Even in his twilight years, he was very impactful, and many people often forget just how critical he was to the success of the Shaq and Wade Heat in 2006. Despite coming off the bench for Shaq that season, he was still in the Defensive Player of the Year conversation and even finished with some first place votes. Adrian Dantley. Maybe he's not the most accomplished player from an accolade standpoint, but he's certainly one of the most underappreciated scorers of NBA history. During a four-year stretch with the Utah Jazz in the 1980s, he was among the best of the best as he averaged over 30 points per game in four straight seasons. The only players who have a longer streak of seasons are Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain. Literally no one else. What's even more impressive is the fact that Dantley shot an insane 56.4% over that four-season stretch. He was also the 1977 Rookie of the Year, he has six All-Star selections and two scoring titles. I understand it's difficult to add older players to the 75 list, when the biggest crime is probably the fact that they were not on the 50 list in 1997. But regardless, this is a man whose talent certainly deserves to be in the conversation. Vince Carter For many years now, basketball's most famous and exciting play has been the slam dunk, and the fact that the greatest dunker ever isn't on this list just doesn't feel right. Carter was so much more than just that though. He was an 8-time All-Star and the 1999 Rookie of the Year. In his prime, he was among the best scorers and the best wing players in the entire league and is currently in the top 20 of the NBA's all-time scoring leaders. He was also a lethal 3-point shooter throughout his career with both efficiency and volume as he currently sits in 6th place on the NBA's all-time list in 3-pointers made. If you think of the greatest dunkers of all time, you'll realize that not many of them can also claim to be one of the greatest perimeter shooters of all time. But that is something that the one known as Half Man, Half Amazing can say about himself. Tony Parker Other than Tim Duncan, the Spurs championship dynasty seems pretty underappreciated with this list. Although Parker was never widely recognized as the best point guard in the league, he was at least consistently among the elites with his solid distributing and his fantastic mid-range and interior scoring. He was a six-time All-Star, made four All-NBA teams, and won four NBA championships. He was also the Finals MVP in 2007 when his Spurs swept the Cavaliers. You're going to be hard-pressed to find a co-star who's won as much as Tony did, yet did not make the 50 greatest list. Clay Thompson. I understand he has only eight seasons under his belt, but when you remove him from being under the shadow of Steph Curry as simply the Warriors second best player, you begin to realize just how incredibly accomplished Thompson really is. He's a five-time All-Star and a three-time NBA champion who also has an all-defense team appearance and is just an underappreciated defensive player in general. He has the record for the most points ever scored in a single quarter with 37, and he holds the record for the most three-pointers ever made in a single game with 14. If it wasn't for Steph Curry, we would probably be recognizing Klay Thompson as the best three-point shooter in the game in an era that's all about three-point shooting. Again, it's only the first half of his career, but Clay has accomplished more in his half than most superstars do in their entire career. Alex English Despite all the dominant scores of the 1980s, no player scored more points over the course of the decade than this man, Alex English. He was an eight-time All-Star, made three All-NBA teams, and was the 1983 scoring champion. Not only did his elite mid-range game enable him to be an elite scorer, but he was incredibly efficient while doing it. Of all the wing players who have at least 25,000 points over the course of their career, Alex is the most efficient from the field with a career percentage of 50.7%. 
He was the focal point of the Denver Nuggets high octane offense, but were just never able to get past the Showtime Lakers despite several deep postseason runs. To finish my list is Sidney Moncrief. Sidney was a 6'3 point guard slash shooting guard who spent the majority of his career with the Milwaukee Bucks through the 1980s. In NBA history, only five guards have ever won the Defensive Player of the Year award, and of those five, Moncrief was the only player who won the award multiple times. The thing is, the Defensive Player of the Year award was introduced in 1983, and that's when Moncrief immediately started winning them. But a lot of people think he was the best defensive player in 1982 as well, so if the award had been available, then he likely would have been the Defensive Player of the Year for three straight seasons as a guard. Needless to say, that is pretty incredible. He was a remarkably gifted athlete and was a reliable and incredibly efficient scorer, especially by point guard standards, as he shot above 50% from the field over the course of his career, averaging as high as 22.5 points per game in 1983. So recently, a specific viewer has been asking me for a very specific video, and on several of my videos, he's actually been one of the most liked comments, which tells me that a decent amount of you actually want this as well. So today, I'm putting together what I believe is the ultimate basketball team, not just based on their talent and greatness, but also from the perspective of how well these players would blend together. This is how it works. There's 15 roster spots and I need to pick three players for each position. There will be the starters, a second unit, and a third unit, and I'll do my best to explain how these units work together. Also, for those of you who want to take the time, let me know in the comments how you would build your ultimate roster. So without further ado, let's get into it. First off, let's determine who the starters will be. I want a team that works together seamlessly, which means I want ball movement, and I want the best point guard for feeding every superstar teammate that he has. For this reason, I'm taking Magic Johnson as my starting point guard. He's got size, speed, and the crucial ability to make every one of his teammates better. As shooting guard, give me Michael Jordan. He's arguably the greatest scorer in NBA history, and he's probably the greatest defensive two guard as well. Not only will Jordan be a strong presence for post scoring, but with Magic as a backcourt teammate, there will be constant fast break opportunities, and Jordan is as good as anyone in the open court. Envision all the transition connections between James Worthy and Magic Johnson of the Showtime Lakers, but instead replace Worthy with a tongue-wagging Michael Jordan. With Magic and Jordan at the guards, it's extremely important that my small forward can spread the floor and hit three-point shots consistently, specifically in catch-and-shoot situations. For this purpose, I'm starting Larry Bird at small forward. This might sound crazy to some, but Bird was basically a player with no weakness whatsoever. He was 6'9", he could shoot from anywhere on the court with extreme efficiency, he was an all-time great passer, he was an underrated defensive player, and he was one of the greatest rebounders ever at his position. Some will argue that LeBron should be a starter, and although I respect that take, I think James fits better with the players in my second unit. While Bird's catch and shoot abilities are incredibly crucial to the chemistry of my starting group. I'm making an exception at the power forward position, and I'm moving Hakeem Olajuwon from his traditional fifth spot to the fourth spot. Hakeem is a player who is certainly a threat in the mid range, and he has the speed and agility to keep up with perimeter players and stretch fours. So I certainly think he has the ability to play the four extremely well, and thanks to his experience playing alongside of the 7 foot 4 inch Ralph Sampson, I'm pretty confident Hakeem would have no issues starting alongside of another all time great big man. Starting at center will be the 7 foot 2 inch Kareem Abdul Jabbar. The captain had one of the most indefensible shots in NBA history, the skyhook, and we know he works in perfect harmony with my starting point guard, Magic Johnson. With Kareem and Hakeem in the starting unit, this team will bolster the most terrifying interior defense that basketball has ever seen. This interior lineup will also be a very familiar situation for Larry Bird, as he's almost always played with two big men down low, in Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish. But now, those two bigs will be on another level, with Kareem and Hakeem. 
As I mentioned, bird spacing and shooting will be pivotal for this starting lineup, but Jordan could also be a massive help in that area, depending on which version of Jordan I take. In this case, I'll take 1990 Michael Jordan, who was hitting 37.6% of his three-point shots on a top 10 volume of three-point attempts. I'll take this starting five against any other starting five that you can come up with. So let's get into the second unit. At point guard, give me Steph Curry, as he's the ultimate floor spacer and the greatest three-point threat. At shooting guard, give me Kobe Bryant, Similar to Michael Jordan, he'll be a lethal two-way threat on the perimeter, and if it's needed, Kobe can operate in a slowed-down offensive attack and go to work from the post. Personally, I would like this version of Kobe to be the 06 version. It was before his knee surgery, so he still had the elite athleticism, but he had also developed his mid-range and perimeter game to be near unstoppable. At small forward is LeBron James. With Curry and Kobe operating as shoot-first guards, I like LeBron starting at the three. But let's be honest, in this second unit, LeBron will be operating as the main floor general, despite the fact that Curry holds the title of point guard. LeBron will love to find a slashing Kobe Bryant and a spot-up shooting Steph Curry, giving these three players near-flawless chemistry for the second unit. For LeBron, I definitely want the 2013 version, that way, his defensive abilities are at their peak, but he also functions as an elite three-point shooter. At power forward, I'll take Kevin Durant, which gives LeBron even more options of shooters on the perimeter. Just picture the 2017 Golden State Warriors, but instead of Draymond operating as the facilitator, it's a prime LeBron James. And instead of Klay Thompson at the two, it's a prime Kobe Bryant. It just won't be fair at all. And then, at the center position for the second unit, I'll take a prime Shaquille O'Neal. Obviously, Shaq has that built-in chemistry and experience with Kobe, but Shaq also fits in perfectly with this scary second unit. When O'Neal was in his prime, the defense would frequently collapse upon him, as the defense desperately sent multiple defenders in a feeble attempt to slow him down. When the opposing team inevitably collapsed upon Shaq, he would kick it out to his open shooters, like Rick Fox and Derek Fisher. But now, he'll be kicking it out to shooters like Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. Talk about an upgrade. Honestly, this second unit is so good that you could argue that they should be the starters instead. But the thing is, the starters are usually the ones who close out the final minutes of the game and I wouldn't want this second unit out there in the closing minutes, because Shaq's free throw shooting is a liability down the stretch, and if the opposing team wanted to execute a hack-a-shack strategy, that could certainly affect the dominating nature of this team. Therefore, I think it's wise to keep this second unit as the second unit. Now let's take a look at the third unit. With my starters and with the backups, I established the identity and the style of my team. So with this third group of players, I'd like to have players who could fill in for injuries and players who could operate as specialists for my specific team's needs. At point guard, give me Gary Payton. With Magic Johnson and with Steph Curry, I don't really have the best defensive presence from the point guard position, but that will not be an issue when the glove is on the court, as he's likely the greatest defensive point guard in NBA history. Not only was Payton also a very capable scorer, but he was also one of the all-time great lob passers. And on this roster, he'll have plenty of weapons to utilize for his alley-oop connections. As shooting guard for the third unit, give me Jerry West. He was also one of the greatest defensive players ever at his position, and West had scoring capabilities that were beyond his time, including solid range from the perimeter. As small forward, give me Scottie Pippen. A dynamic slasher, an alley-oop partner for Gary Payton and Magic Johnson, and he'll be an available lockdown perimeter defender whenever the team needs him. At power forward, I'll take Tim Duncan. He's smart, unselfish, and fundamentally sound. Duncan is also a player who is very comfortable playing alongside of another all-time great big, and in this case, beside him will be the ultimate winner rounded out with Bill Russell at the center position, and what you have here is the most suffocating and defensively soul-crushing third unit ever. All of these players are capable passers at their positions, 
And if any starter is struggling with their assignment for any reason, these substitutes will address that issue immediately and adequately. Now I know, some of you have noticed the triggering omission, as I left Wilt Chamberlain off the roster, which seems especially insane coming from me since I'm usually one of the biggest advocates for Wilt's legacy and greatness. But the thing is, this roster is already extremely loaded with all-time great bigs, and chemistry is imperative for this roster to be the best that it can be. Because of this, I'd rather have the bigs who spent the prime of their careers in a more team-oriented offense. So that concludes my 15-man roster. I'm not gonna lie, I would love to see my starters take on the second unit, and even my third unit could serve as a challenger as well. Obviously, I do not believe my roster is objectively the greatest possible team imaginable. But it's just that in my opinion. Who knows, maybe in a week from now, I'll have a different opinion and change up my roster. But for now, this is what makes the most sense to me. Since it's a day that ends in Y, LeBron James is in the news cycle once again. But this time, it's specifically for his late game decision that he made this last Monday night against the Miami Heat. The Lakers were down by just one point with only seconds remaining, and with the game on the line, LeBron did something that he's done many times before. He drove to the basket, and when the defense inevitably collapsed upon him, LeBron kicks the ball out to the open shooter, which in this case was Cam Reddish. Cam missed the three-point shot, and the Heat go on to win the game. Now as always, in this modern era of social media, everyone began giving their take on the matter. Some believe LeBron made the correct basketball play, while others think he should have looked to score on his own. Obviously, people and their biases play a huge factor here. In most cases, those who consider themselves a LeBron fan went on to defend his decision, and those who are not fans of LeBron criticized him for not making better decisions. So where do I stand on this? I gotta be honest. From an emotional standpoint, I'm actually pretty conflicted on this topic. For one, I'm a diehard Lakers fan. I always have been, and I always will be. So from this angle, I want LeBron to do whatever he has to do in order to win the game. And if that's pass it, then by all means, pass it. But at the same time, I think I speak for many Laker fans when I say that for roughly 20 years, we were used to a superstar who had a shoot first mentality. So from that perspective, we kind of want our best player to be taking that shot when the game's on the line. At least in that aspect, I recognize some of my own personal bias. Now here's the thing, this isn't a new topic by any means. LeBron's most famous hater, Skip Bayless, used to preach over and over again that LeBron would pass the ball in these late game situations because he was afraid of going to the free throw line with the game at stake. Obviously, take these opinions from Skip with a major sack of salt. In the 2012 NBA All-Star Game, LeBron had the chance to win the game for the East, while being guarded by the West Kobe Bryant, and LeBron opted to pass the ball to another shooter, not once, but twice. After the second attempt, which ended up being a turnover, LeBron was given an earful from Kobe and Carmelo, who clearly believed that LeBron should have taken that shot himself. Here's the deal though, this is usually who LeBron is, and he knows it. On screen is a clip of LeBron, which occurred at a press conference after his Cavs just won the East in 2017, and after he had just passed Michael Jordan on the all-time playoff scoring list. He said that it was his goal to teach the youth that passing the ball is okay, that making the extra pass and finding the open shooter is the correct basketball play. That's the legacy he wants to leave. Now honestly, this is one of my favorite characteristics about LeBron as a player and as a person. He firmly believes this, and he demonstrates his belief of it over and over again. He doesn't give in to the pressure to play the game just like Michael Jordan would or just like Kobe Bryant would. But instead, he's comfortable in who he is and chooses to consistently make what he believes is the best basketball play. But then, that obviously begs the question, is this truly the best basketball play to make? Should a superstar look to score or facilitate in these late game situations? Well, looking at LeBron's track record of passing in late game moments, a lot of them haven't gone particularly well. 
beyond the recent Cam Reddish miss, and beyond the two failed All-Star Game passes in 2012, he also has the pass to Danny Green in Game 5 of the 2020 NBA Finals. Green was completely wide open, but he missed the shot, and the Heat ended up extending the series to six games. More recently, there was this pass to Carmelo Anthony in the 2021-2022 season. The game was tied, and LeBron had an easy reverse layup if he wanted it, but instead, he opted to go with the open man at the three-point line. Now, it hasn't always ended poorly for LeBron. In the 2012-2013 regular season against the Denver Nuggets, LeBron drove and kicked the ball out to the wide-open Ray Allen, and this time, Allen buried the three-point jumper for the game-winning four-point play. Now here's the thing. This successful bucket actually supports my point of whether or not this is the correct basketball play. And my answer is, it depends. Who you're passing the ball to matters significantly in each scenario. When LeBron passed the ball to an open Ray Allen, he was putting the fate of the game in the hands of one of the greatest three-point shooters in NBA history. But that wasn't the case in the situations where the shots were missed. When Danny Green missed that game-winning three-point attempt in the 2020 NBA Finals, many people forget that he was in the midst of being crucified by Laker fans because he had only made 26% of his three-point attempts over the course of those finals up to that point. So in reality, that was probably the reason why he was open in the first place. In the case of the Carmelo Anthony miss, LeBron was passing the ball to a decent shooter, but in order to do that, he passed up a wide open layup in a tied game. And lastly, in the case of the recent game against the Heat, Cam Reddish was only hitting an awful 15% of his three point attempts on the season. So again, that was probably the reason he was so open. So were these plays the correct basketball plays? Not in these scenarios, given who the ball was being passed to, and in some cases, what LeBron was passing up for himself. Not to mention the fact that in each of these game-on-the-line scenarios, it was at most a one-point game. So now you have to ask the question if an open three is smarter shot selection than a slightly contested two-point shot, which is much closer to the basket. Some will point out the fact that guys like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant kicked the ball out to open shooters, and when the shots went in, they were praised for it. Now this is certainly true, but it also works along with my point that it highly depends on who the ball is being passed to. When Michael Jordan passed the ball to an open Steve Kerr in the 1997 NBA Finals, he wasn't just passing it to some mediocre role player, but he was passing the ball to literally one of the most efficient shooters in the history of basketball. That is a trustworthy shooter with the game on the line. When Kobe passed the ball to Derek Fisher in Game 4 of the 2009 Finals, that was a shooter who was hitting 40% of his three-point shots throughout the year, and who had a history of hitting clutch shots for the Lakers organization. Once again, that is a trustworthy shooter. MJ doesn't have a history of iconic game-winning passes where he dished the ball out to guys like Judd Bushler and Scott Burrell. Kobe doesn't have a history of iconic game-winning passes to guys like Devin George and Smush Parker. That is essentially the equivalent of LeBron placing the fate of the game in the hands of guys like Cam Reddish. So is passing in this scenario the correct basketball play? I would say sometimes. If LeBron was kicking the ball out to quality shooting teammates of years past, like Kyle Korver, Mike Miller, or Ray Allen, and one of them misses that shot, well then you live with that result, and keep your head held high knowing that you made the correct basketball play. But when these are the types of guys that LeBron has waiting in the wings, one, it should get Rob Palenka to step up and provide LeBron with the spot-up shooters he needs, two, it should make us question why Darvin Ham has those kind of players on the court to close the game, and three, it should incentivize LeBron to look to score for himself. I understand that the great defender Bam Adebayo came over as the help defender, which would have made that basket difficult to convert for LeBron. But of course, the defense is going to collapse if LeBron is going to take it all the way to the rim. So he kind of brought that upon himself. 
In this scenario, I would have preferred LeBron to stop and pull up between 15 to 18 feet out with a routine step back jumper over the smaller Jimmy Butler and live with the result. Are you seriously trying to tell me that LeBron can't get that shot at will? Again, every situation is somewhat different, and it's easy for us to critique every single minor detail in hindsight. But for me personally, when you look at who's involved and who the game is being relied upon, this was not the correct basketball play. With the right supporting cast, it is. But as a Lakers fan, I'm hoping LeBron starts discerning the difference better moving forward. It's the most regurgitated conversation in all of basketball. Mainstream media refuses to put the topic aside because it's always a sure bet to get general audiences' attention. And if you go on social media, it seems almost every take and every basketball highlight somehow gets shoehorned into the Jordan versus LeBron topic, as fanboys on both sides can't stop fighting in their honor. Now to be clear, I've made numerous videos on this topic, expressing my opinions, and over time, some of those stances have softened a bit. But although I've given my thoughts on who should be first, second, and third, I've never expressed my opinion on the actual overarching topic itself. Is the GOAT discussion smart or stupid? Is it good for the game of basketball or is it bad? Although most people are willing to engage in the conversation, there are those who try to attack my intelligence for even engaging in the topic in the first place. Now those people could certainly lighten up a bit, but I honestly can't even say that I fully disagree with them. One of the most ironic things to me is how Michael Jordan fans will fight so hard to convince people of MJ's case as the greatest player of all time when Michael Jordan doesn't even do that himself. At this point, I'm sure many of you have seen this clip, but this is from April 16th, 1996. The Bulls had just won their 70th game in their historic record-breaking season, and in the post-game press conference, when asked if this accomplishment pushed him ahead of all the other greats, MJ had this to say. No, I think that's something that I, I really can say can be established. Each one of us play in our different eras, with different teams, with different levels of success, and to compare all of them and say one's better than the next, it's an unfair justice to, to the art or to the artists, you know, being that Magic Johnson, Will Chamberlain, all the guys before me were, were the artists of, of this game of basketball, and we've all learned from them, and we've in, improved the, the, the picture to a certain extent. And to say that one improvement is better than all of it, it's an unfair uh, assessment. Even 21 years after that original statement was made, MJ still maintained a similar viewpoint. In 2017, in an interview with a cigar aficionado, Jordan was asked about his opinion on the Tiger Woods and Jack Nicholas GOAT discussion for the sport of golf. And MJ not only gives his opinion, but he thoroughly explains his thought process for his own sport. Take a listen. Uh, I, I, I beg to differ, and I, I'll give a different analogy to that because First of all, you're, you're never going to say who's the greatest of all time. To me, I think that's that's more for PR and more for selling mm -hmm. stories and, and getting hype. Uh, Jack and, and Tiger never played against each other. They never played in the same tournament. They never played with the same equipment. They never played with the same you know length of golf course. I never played against Will Chamberlain. I never played against you know Jerry West. To now say that you know one's greater than the other is being a little bit you know unfair. You know. Uh, I think when you can see the similarities and you understand, if you, this is one way you can judge the two. How much impact did each change or or evolve the game? Jack during his time when he played, but Tiger during his time. Now, you know, obviously Jack won more during the time he played. Tiger evolved it to where it was you know, it crossed a lot of different boundaries where it's not just a white guy's sport, you know, the black guys, Afro-American, you know, all the, the minorities play the game. Mm -hmm. And you play at a level to where mm -hmm. it generated so much interest financially that it grew the game from a financial standpoint. Now, does that constitute him being the greatest? Or does that mean he's any less than, than Jack? I think it's unfair. Yeah, Jack probably has, he has 18 more majors, uh, 18 majors and Tiger's got 14. And I think those are when, you know, that's how people are judging certain things. I won six championships. Bill Russell won 11. 
does that make Bill Russell better than me and make me better than him? No, because we play at different eras. So when you try to equate who's the greatest of all time, it's an unfair parallel. It's an unfair choice. And I think, you know, those are the demons that, you know, obviously Tiger had to live with and he's going to be challenged and he's going to be graded upon that. But for me, I think they're both great. I would never say one is greater than the other. That's me. That's my opinion. Okay. Again, this take is ironic because nobody fights harder for their GOAT candidate than Jordan fans do. But make no mistake, Jordan isn't the only player who doesn't entertain the discussion. In an interview in March of 2019, Kobe explained his thoughts on people comparing greats to one another, and this is what he had to say. It's hard for people to believe, but I really don't care. You know, like, I moved on. You, you know, so like, you have a career, you do the best you can with the 20 years I was very fortunate to play, and then you shelf it, you're done. You move on to the next thing. So now I'm focused on these next 20 years. And so that, those debates are entertaining, I'm sure. And, you know, it's uh, fun for people to engage on those, engage in those. But for me personally, it doesn't matter. So when everyone gets into the, is LeBron better than Kobe, whatever it is, and you hear it, you can't not hear it. You have like no reaction. Sure. No, I think the, the best way to explain it is uh, I typically do not engage in things that I cannot definitively win. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Sure. It's argument. Argue for what? If you agree with these perspectives from Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, then you basically agree that the GOAT conversation is ridiculous altogether. The thing is, not every GOAT candidate holds the same viewpoint and approach. Years ago, LeBron famously got the basketball world in a frenzy when he made this statement about himself. That one so right there made me the greatest player of all time. For That's so what many I felt. reasons. I was super, super ecstatic to win one for Cleveland because of the 52-year drought. Like, I was ecstatic. Like, obviously, I showed that, that the first wave of emotion was when y'all everyone saw me crying. Like, that was all for 52 years of everything in sports going on in Cleveland. And then after I stopped, I was like, that one right there made you the greatest player of all time. You know, everybody was just talking how they were the greatest team of all time. Like, it was the greatest team to ever assembled. And for us to come back, you know, the way we came back in that fashion, I was like, now here's the thing, when LeBron made this statement, it initially seemed to do him more harm than good, as seemingly everyone began to take aim at him for his confident viewpoint. Generally, people don't like it when someone sings their own praises, and unless you have the right charisma and character to make it work, like Muhammad Ali for example, then people generally are not going to agree with you, and are usually going to try to remove you from the pedestal that you placed yourself on. Now on the other hand, this was the comment that really sparked the debate, and LeBron used the narrative that has become one of his strongest arguments for the title of greatest player of all time. So maybe this was actually a brilliant move by LeBron, as he challenged people to think outside of the box of Jordan being the greatest ever. But it's just like MJ said, everything here is subjective. They're different players on different teams in different positions from different eras there's basically no way to objectively compare these legends side by side to one another, because there's just too many variables that are literally impossible to accurately quantify. So basically, I agree, the GOAT debate is in fact stupid, and it's ridiculous how emotionally involved people get over something that they can't objectively win. Now that I've established my view that the GOAT debate is in fact ridiculous and doesn't deserve much credibility whatsoever, I could just end the video here and now, but I'm not doing that, because I believe that the GOAT debate is also awesome. Like I said before, people have criticized me for engaging in this debate as often as I do, and although I see where they're coming from, I also think they're missing one of the fundamental realities of the game of basketball and of sports in general. This is all about competition. The most simplistic objective of basketball is scoring more points than the other team to win the game. It's a competitive form of measurement. So of course, players and fans are naturally going to make those competitive measurements on an individual level. It's simply an extension of that competitive nature. As much as Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant want to act like they're above these comparisons, to a certain extent, these are debates they've also engaged in at one point or another. 
1997, at the ceremony of the 50 greatest players of all time, multiple witnesses have claimed that they saw Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain having an extensive debate on which one of them was better. In 2012, at the Drew League, Kobe engaged with a fan, claiming that he was above Michael Jordan on the all-time list. And another legend, Bill Russell, has never been shy about making his case above Wilt Chamberlain and Michael Jordan. Just because these guys don't say it in front of a mic at a press conference doesn't mean they don't think it, they don't believe it, and it doesn't mean they don't argue it privately. You can make the point that this discussion is pointless, and there can ultimately be no victor. But let's be real, we're competitive guys, and we're still gonna try. In my mind, basketball lore isn't all that different from superhero lore. In reality, you'll never see Superman fight Goku, yet we'll try to argue who would win. In a similar fashion, you'll never see Michael Jordan go up against LeBron James, but we'll still try to argue who would win. Face it, without these conversations, the game and the community is just a lot less enjoyable in general. But I will say this, if I have one bit of advice for the GOAT discussion, it would be to just remember, like Kobe said, there cannot possibly be an objective winner. So don't foolishly attach your emotional state to it. It's truly not worth that much of your energy. And if it is something that goes as far as affecting your mental health or how you treat others, then maybe it's time for some reflection and considering the fact that maybe you've taken this a bit too far. So roughly around a month ago, the former NBA superstar Gilbert Arenas shared an opinion on another basketball legend that really captured my attention. Since he made these comments, I've been wanting to make this video for quite a while now. Now before we get into what he said, let me first be clear about my opinion on Arenas. As a YouTuber and as an analyst, Gilbert seems to be one of those guys who knows the right bold and sometimes outlandish takes that are perfectly suited to demand attention. Regardless of your opinion on him as an analyst, you have to recognize that this man is fantastic at his job when it comes to gaining viewers and getting basketball circles talking. Personally, I think some of his basketball opinions are ridiculous and worthy of criticism. But I'll also admit that every once in a while, he'll say something that's flat out brilliant, with tremendous insight and a unique perspective that people usually don't consider. So I'll stop delaying this any longer and take a listen for yourself to what he said. It was like, it was like Vince Carter, right? Yes. Vin it was just easy. Like, I, I, like, I'm so mad at Vince for what he did mm. to the game. The GOAT debate what should have been him. 100%. Okay. He was so naturally gifted than anything you've ever seen. Period. He had everything. There was no, like, he had everything. He dribble, shoot, fade, moves. Footwork, I, he everything. He had everything. If he had this, the mindset, like, Kobe, like, I'm better than everyone, and I'm going to show y'all each. There was nobody who was stopping that man. Right. There was nothing that was stopping Vince Carter. When Vince Carter came in the lane, there was no big man that was willing to challenge it because they didn't want to be on ESPN. Excuse me. That that was that was him. Think about go, show Toronto. Every time he went back to Toronto, show those stats because he didn't like them. They traded. Watch what he did to them every single time. He averaged damn near four. So you think the trade is what was what, what stopped his uh, hungriness? I just think he was he was just too nice. Now, although I've made several videos on Vince Carter, and I do believe he was one of the best players of his era, Gilbert is forcing me to look at him with a more critical lens. So let's quickly recap who Carter was and what his reputation is. Vince was a 6'6 shooting guard slash small forward who was taken with the fifth overall pick in the 1998 NBA draft. Carter is recognized today as the greatest dunker in NBA history. He's one of the greatest vertical leapers of all time. He was an all-time great three-point shooter. He could handle the basketball. He could shoot from just about anywhere on the court. He's among the players with the most game-winning shots in NBA history. He had one of the longest careers that the league has ever seen, and his overall athleticism was off the charts. Yet, with all of that being said, he's not typically recognized as a top 10, top 20, or even top 30 player in the league's history. So just why is that? 
As Gilbert alluded to, Vince was a player who had all the skills, all the abilities, and seemingly all of the ingredients to be one of the all-time greats. This isn't something I'm just observing and saying in our modern year of 2023, but this was the way people felt about Carter in his first few seasons in the NBA. He was a player who was constantly being compared to Michael Jordan, and many people even went as far as calling him the next Michael Jordan. Whether it was his nicknames or his collectibles, everyone was continuously drawing parallels between Air Jordan and Air Canada. Just to give you some perspective on the level of hype for Carter in his early career, consider this. I still have my Beckett Price Guide magazine from the summer of the year 2000. These tell you the market value of NBA trading cards at that time. And in basically every basketball set, Vince Carter's cards were worth more than the great Kobe Bryant, regardless of the fact that Kobe had just won a championship in Los Angeles. That is how good people were projecting Carter to be. The thing is, I witnessed the entirety of Insanity's career, so I have my own perspective on why he didn't make it to that all-time great status. For one, I do agree with Gilbert in the sense that Carter was just too nice. That may be a bit of an oversimplification, but to expand on this take, I would say that Carter lacked the relentless competitive drive and tenacity. Unlike guys like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and Larry Bird, Carter didn't usually approach the game with an angry chip on his shoulder. And the few cases where he did were often revenge games against his former team, the Toronto Raptors. And Agent Zero was absolutely correct on this point as well. Some of the best games of Carter's career came against his former team, the Raptors. And it was obvious to everyone who witnessed those games that he had a little extra motivation heading into those contests. Honestly, I see this as evidence that Carter's competitive drive was a bit inconsistent in comparison to the previously mentioned great wing players. I believe another indication of a player's competitive drive is how he plays on the defensive end of the floor since basically half of what makes a player a great defender is his hustle, his effort, and his commitment. Skilled athletic greats like Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Kobe Bryant, and LeBron James all made all defense teams numerous times, yet Carter never earned a single selection, and he's usually described today as a decent defender at best. Another observation of mine is that Carter didn't maintain his physical conditioning as well as those other greats. Yes, he was able to do windmill dunks in his early 40s, but I always viewed that as more of his natural born athleticism rather than his commitment to staying in the best shape possible. For the most part, Carter had an extremely healthy basketball career, yet he started putting on weight in his days after Toronto. And by the time he was in his early 30s, he had been reduced to that of a role player, when most of the all-time great superstars were still competing for championships at that age. So yeah, he was kinda too nice, but for a lack of a better term, he simply didn't have that dog in him like many other greats have had. Now I will say, I do think it's a little unfair for Gilbert to say that he would have been so much better if he had the drive and nature of Kobe Bryant. Well, no duh, Sherlock. That's true for just about every former player in basketball history, including Gilbert Arenas. But at the heart of what he's saying, I do get his point. The ceiling for Carter was so much higher than what he actually reached, because his commitment seemingly wasn't as strong as it was for many other legends. By no means is this meant to be a slander video towards Vince Carter. He was an incredible player who gets very overlooked by modern NBA stars. But to say that he had all of the abilities and all of the gifts to be a potential GOAT candidate, if he had the intangibles to go with it, is a correct statement in my humble opinion. Let me start off this video by making my heart and feelings clear. I freaking love my job, and I love this group of subscribers that I've got. If you're a YouTuber and you're not grateful for your following, something must be wrong about the way you were raised. 
When I take my wife to dinner, we say a prayer and thank the Lord for what we've been given. And sometimes I literally audibly say, thank you subs as well. And we usually chuckle, but the gesture is genuine. I never want to lose that attitude of gratitude when it comes to how much you guys have blessed my life. So anyway, enough already about that warm and fuzzy sappy crap. Sometimes, not specifically my audience, but the basketball community in general, make certain narratives and critiques that honestly blow my mind with how ridiculous they are. And it gets to a point where you hear them regurgitated enough that it literally gets to the point of annoyance. I know I'm not speaking a foreign language here. You guys are basketball fans with your own strong opinions. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Today, I'm explaining the three things that annoy me the most about basketball fandom as a whole. And let me know in the comments what are some things that annoy you as well. First off, the criticism of quote, bad defense in specific eras. This goes both ways. Older basketball fans criticize the general defense of the modern era, and younger basketball fans criticize the defense of past eras. Neither perspective particularly annoys me on the surface level, but for me, it's their approach that drives me insane. If you go on social media, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, or whatever, you'll see a highlight from past basketball eras, and in the comments will be annoying modern fans, talking about how defense was horrible back then. At the same time, you'll see current NBA highlights, and in the comments will be a bunch of triggered old guys talking about how bad defense is today. The annoying part is how people draw these massive conclusions based on anecdotal evidence. Anyone can draw some massive conclusion off of one specific play, but that play doesn't do an accurate job of portraying the lay of the land as a whole. Even the greatest defensive players in NBA history have had instances where they were lazy on defense, or didn't make the right rotations when they needed to. Now if there's a massive 15 minute long compilation video of a specific player being lazy on defense, well then okay, well now we can solidify a narrative. But let's not be the kind of fan who saw one player poorly defending Michael Jordan, or one guy poorly defending LeBron James, so now we have to condemn an entire era for it. The more interesting conversation are the way defenses have changed throughout the eras, and the way the rules allow certain advantages while eliminating others. Stuff like the switch from the man defenses to zone defenses, the elimination of hand checking, the changes in refereeing, and the way the game is more spaced out due to better perimeter shooting. All of these are more worthy of an in-depth discussion than a couple of dudes getting lazy on defense, which has literally been happening since the day the game was invented. The second thing that significantly annoys me is when people tell me that I'm too biased towards older players. If any of you viewers consider yourself a basketball historian, get ready to hear a lot of this one. This is obviously coming fresh after my 30 greatest players video, and in the video, I gave my very subjective list of the best players of all time. As always, these types of lists tend to trigger people, and one of the more common criticisms was that my list was too biased toward older players. I'm not gonna lie, this was one of the dumbest casual takes I've heard. This is how these Neanderthals think. The last 15 years in NBA history are what they consider as new players, and the first 61 years of NBA history are all lumped together and are considered as old players. And if you're picking and ranking players higher from here than you are from here, then you're too biased towards older players. Not only are the quote older players a much larger pool, but all of these guys also have completed resumes, while the younger players do not. Now listen, angry 15 year old in the chat. Unlike you, the NBA was not born yesterday. In the rich history of this game, there are many incredibly talented and deserving individuals. You're talking about more than six decades worth of amazing basketball that you simply write off as older players. The issue isn't that we're too biased towards older generations. The issue is that you have a very limited knowledge of basketball history. But you know, it's a free country. So go ahead and keep calling everything that's happened in the last 10 years the greatest thing of all time, even though your conscious reality of time is roughly 10 years. You are definitely the arbiter of what's the greatest thing of all time. 
Now you guys didn't think I was just gonna go after some of the younger fans, right? Nope. For my third topic of annoyance, I'm looking at a few of the older fellas in the community, who always love to claim that modern players wouldn't have survived in previous eras. I hate to break it to you, but this everything was better back in my day rhetoric is something that's basically always been a thing in the NBA. This is an interview from Conan O'Brien's show in 1997. And in the interview, Wilt Chamberlain claims that the unstoppable force that is Shaquille O'Neal would struggle against centers from the 1960s. In the same interview, listen what he goes on to say about Michael Jordan playing in his era. Well, his playing style is he's six foot seven and he's uh, like 197 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, coming into what we call our domain, the pivot mm -hmm. for us big guys, mm -hmm. would not have been very wise of Michael, you know, if he was playing during our time. Uh, so we would say, uh, Michael, you know, as long as you do all those fancy things outside of where we are, that's fine. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been good for Michael. Really? No. You yeah. think uh, he'd have been crushed is what you're saying? I don't think I know you've been crushed. <laughs> right, yeah. so you're saying Michael Jordan back then would have been on the bench the whole time. Absolutely, uh, you know, being considered how to think about that. And that's, and that's the truth. This isn't just a Wilt Chamberlain thing either, but guys like Julius Irving and many others have made claims like this as well. At one point, this was a common narrative coming from the older generation, that the 90s was the era of soft basketball. 30 years after Wilt played, people were belittling the competition of Michael Jordan. And now, 30 years after Michael Jordan played, people are belittling the competition of the modern game. Now sure, in different eras, there are different rules. In the 80s, you could straight up clobber someone and not get severely punished for it, since the flagrant foul basically wasn't implemented until the year 1990. With that being said, a guy who's 6'9", 260 pounds, is allowed to dish out physical punishment as well. Sure, the bad boy Detroit Pistons would have tried to clobber a guy like LeBron James, but that's easier said than done. Defensive play styles like that would certainly be an adjustment for modern players. But when you say a guy like LeBron or Steph Curry wouldn't survive in the 80s or 90s, do you mean that literally? If not, do you mean that they would just retire? Of course they wouldn't. That's ridiculous. They would adapt and they would thrive. I believe the physicality of previous generations has less to do with the mental toughness of the players and is more about what the league permitted back then compared to the more strict modern NBA. Acting like these grown men would go home crying to their mama is a little overly dramatic to say the least. The NBA has had many questionable things happen throughout its history. We all know about the refereeing drama of the 2002 Western Conference Finals, which is a series that Tim Donaghy refereed, who was later convicted for crimes related to betting on basketball games, some of which he actually called. There's been other suspicions, like the legitimacy of how the Knicks landed Patrick Ewing in the 1985 NBA draft, and even how the Lakers landed Lonzo Ball in the 2017 draft. In 2004, David Stern was asked who his dream matchup would be in the NBA Finals, and he said the Lakers versus the Lakers. Yes, the former commissioner of the NBA actually said that while he was the commissioner of the NBA. If he was smart in that moment, like a lot of dishonest politicians are, then he would have known not to give a direct answer to that question. But the reason he gave that answer was obvious. The Lakers brand is a draw for both players and fans, and the Lakers being in the NBA Finals is usually a guarantee of fantastic TV ratings, which was great for David Stern and the league office. This was especially the case in the early 2000s, when you could see the major contrast in interest and viewers between whenever the Lakers were in the Finals compared to whenever the Spurs were in the Finals. The combination of David Stern's comments with all of the controversial events that took place during that era have led many fans to question the legitimacy of the league's history as a whole. Some have even gone as far as claiming that the entire NBA is scripted. The championship winners are predetermined and the league is controlled in such a way that only supports its own self-interest. Now do I personally believe that there are some shady decisions in the NBA's past? Absolutely. There's way too much smoke for there not to be some fire. But do I believe the NBA is scripted as a whole? Of course not. Simply because there's some things that you just can't script. 
If all of the details of the league were scripted, then there's several enticing NBA Finals matchups that we would have got instead rather than the ones that actually happened. Today, I'm going through some of those Finals matchups, breaking down what made them enticing and why the league office wanted it. And yes, there will be heavy representation from the Lakers since David Stern made it abundantly clear that they were often the team that the league wanted. 1997, Bulls vs Rockets. This was very nearly the matchup that we got, but thanks to John Stockton's buzzer-beating three-pointer in Game 6 of the West Finals, the NBA Finals matchup became the Bulls and the Utah Jazz. Between Michael Jordan's Bulls and Hakeem's Rockets, the 97 Finals would have been represented by the two players who accounted for the NBA's past six championships leading up to those Finals. The Bulls would have had their usual core of Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman, while the Rockets had a super team of their own, of Akeem Olajuwon, Charles Barkley, and Clyde Drexler. All three of these Rockets stars were selected to be NBA All-Stars, as each player pitched in around 20 points per game. Jordan naysayers love to point out the fact that MJ never defeated a super team in the NBA Finals, but this would have been his opportunity. Sure, some point out that the Rockets team was older and past their prime, but I never really bought that as valid criticism since all the Bulls and Jazz stars were in their mid-30s as well, just like the Rockets. Whenever Jordan's Bulls were in the finals, the TV ratings were through the roof, but this matchup likely would have taken it to another level. 2006, Lakers vs Heat. Now this matchup certainly wasn't in the realm of possibility in an unscripted league, considering how Kobe had teammates like Smush Parker, Luke Walton, and Chris Mim in the starting lineup. But if the league could have any scripted matchup that it wanted, this would have been it. We were recently removed from the Shaq and Kobe split in the summer of 2004, and the two players' icy relationship had made for some must-see television whenever they met up in the regular season. For example, the two players squared off in the Christmas Day game in 2004, and this was the most watched Christmas Day game in NBA history. It had a TV rating of 7.3 for a total of 13.2 million viewers. To put that in perspective, that Shaq and Kobe regular season game had more viewers than any NBA Finals game of the last two seasons. A Shaq vs Kobe Finals matchup recently after their split would have been a dream come true for the league office. 2009, Lakers vs Cavaliers. Not only the league office, but the majority of NBA fans would have preferred this matchup compared to the Lakers and Magic one that we got. At the time, it was a heated debate for the title of the best player in the entire league between Kobe Bryant and LeBron James. Even their Nike puppet commercials felt like a foreshadowing of the two faces of the league squaring off on the game's biggest stage. Despite the fact that either LeBron or Kobe were in the finals from 2008 to 2018, somehow these two narrowly avoided each other, which unfortunately kept us from experiencing what would have been one of the most highly anticipated NBA Finals matchups of modern history. 2011, Heat vs Lakers. The Dallas Mavericks were this season's NBA champions, and they certainly earned it as they were the team that put a stop to both Los Angeles and Miami's playoff runs. But if it hadn't been for them, and certainly if this NBA season had been scripted, then it would have been a finals matchup between Kobe's Lakers and LeBron's Heat. For the Lakers, this would have been their chance at a three-peat and an opportunity for Kobe to win his sixth championship ring, equaling him to Michael Jordan's total. On the other hand, LeBron was looking for his first ring to begin his championship legacy, and what better way to do it than putting an end to Kobe and the Lakers' dynasty? The star power in this series would have been insane, and the league office must have been disappointed when Dirk and the Mavericks destroyed that possibility. 2020, Lakers vs Celtics. Despite the historically popular Lakers representing the Western Conference, the 2020 NBA Finals still had the worst television ratings of NBA Finals history. Can't really say that was a surprise, as the ratings were bad throughout those entire playoffs. At the beginning of those playoffs, Adam Silver had to have been praying for a Lakers and Celtics matchup, which would have resurrected the most famous rivalry of basketball history, and may have been the jolt of excitement the league needed for that season. It also would have featured the face of the NBA today against a guy who has a chance to be the face of the league in the years to come. Throw in the fact that the Lakers were determined to win a ring for Kobe and have it be against the rivaled Celtics 10 years after Kobe won his last ring against them, 
and a higher level of interest would have been there for sure. When it comes to NBA analysts and former players with opinions, there's quite a few of them that I just can't stand. But I gotta be honest, none of them make me facepalm as often as the former Wizards All-Star Gilbert Arenas, as just recently, he had possibly the most awful take that I've ever heard, and I simply can't ignore it. So for those of you who are not in the know, let me quickly provide you with some context. Hakeem Olajuwon is a former NBA legend, and he was a 7-foot superstar who played in the NBA from 1984 until 2002. Hakeem had a lot of skills on the basketball court, but possibly his greatest skill was his stellar footwork, as he utilized it to give him an offensive advantage in the past. To this day, many people believe Hakeem Olajuwon had the greatest footwork of any player who's ever played. Because of this, many active players have sought out Olajuwon long after his retirement, as they look to learn from his teaching and apply it to their game. Now after all this time, Hakeem Olajuwon decided to monetize these private workouts with NBA players, and is now charging $50,000 for a week of workouts. Now this is hardly a newsworthy story, that is, until Gilbert Arenas made it one. Take a listen for yourself on what Arenas had to say about Elijah One's 50k training sessions. <laughs> I'm sorry, but nobody doing it. All you old son staying down. Nobody, nobody want the Hakeem Elijah One sky look. Nobody want none of that shit. All right, let it go. Fifty. You should be ashamed of yourself. Charging these young whippersnappers. Fifty. When you came in the league in 1984, you wasn't getting fifty thousand a game. <laughs> you trying to make your money back through the youth, Giannis. No, I'm all for trainers getting their money. A week? You know how many big men we did? Hey, I'm, bl I'm blaming Hakeem Olajuwon for the reason we lost Big Ben. The reason the five men is gone is because they go on the motherfuckers from the 90s and 80s learning their motherfucking booze. No, 50,000. <laughs> Brooke Lopez, you're good. Just go back to the basics, huh? You doing fine, Giannis. That. I'm sorry, Giannis, but I would not let you spend 50,000. 50,000? Come here. I teach you all that shit. Look. Boom. Look. I got moves. I got moves. I'm still simple. I got moves on top of moves. I don't even know. I got I got books on top of books on moves. I keep notes. What? For 45 grand, I give you the upgraded version. He ain't been good since the 90s. That means all the moves in the 2000s, early 2000s. He don't know. 2010. He don't know. 2020. He don't know. He don't know. Who the f you gonna do the moves on? Okay. Wow. Where do I even start? First off, I see nothing wrong with Hakeem Olajuwon charging 50 G's for private workouts to learn his footwork. That's pocket change for modern NBA players. Many people, including yours truly, believe that Hakeem had the best basketball footwork of any person to ever live. And based on the fact that all-star level players keep going to Hakeem for his teaching, tells me that he's pretty good at coaching it. Imagine being so arrogant and so entitled that you think that you should be getting private lessons from someone who is the best in the world at what they're teaching, completely free of charge. Hakeem is simply living by the wise motto, If you're good at something, never do it for free. Sure, $50,000 might sound like a lot to you and me. But you have to remember, this is a multimillionaire teaching other multimillionaires how to be better at what makes their millions. That's called an investment, Gilbert. Based on these facts, it's completely reasonable for Hakeem to charge this amount for his private time and energy. Second, I always find it ridiculous how people act like the players from past generations are so far removed from the modern game. I also find it funny that Gilbert acts like Hakeem Olajuwon's skills and moves are so outdated. Yet by the end of his rant, he's pleading for players to give him money for his own personal workout sessions. Hakeem's final season in the NBA was the 2001-2002 season, which also happened to be the rookie season for Gilbert Arenas. So not only was Hakeem around not that long before Arenas, but some of their careers even slightly overlapped. Yet this clown has the audacity to act like Elijah Wan is some sort of ancient dinosaur with nothing to offer. 
By the same logic that Akeem Olajuwon is outdated and irrelevant, Gilbert Arenas is also outdated and irrelevant. But here's the thing that's crazy to me. Acting like Hakeem's skills are not valuable to the modern game is one of the dumbest takes I've ever heard. Have we seriously become so okay with legalizing traveling in the NBA that solid footwork is now being considered outdated? Even most young fans of modern basketball don't agree with Arenas on his assessment. Because if anything, Hakeem is usually the center who is often referred to as ahead of his time. Sure, some modern fans act like Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain would struggle in the modern NBA, but who the hell says that about Hakeem? With his intelligence, his footwork, his mid-range shooting, his quickness, and with his remarkable athleticism, it's completely reasonable to assume that Elijah Wan would have been one of the best players in the league even if he played in the modern game. Clearly his nickname, Agent Zero, was on point, as in, zero brain cells. I honestly have to wonder, is he really so naive about NBA history that he's mixing up Hakeem Olajuwon with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Because at one point, he's making fun of the idea of Hakeem dominating the game with his sky hook shot. And although Hakeem did have a hook shot in his arsenal, most of his baskets were variations of face-up mid-range jumpers that translate perfectly well to the modern game. Now as always, I'm sure there might be some people viewing this video wondering why we should listen to the opinion of this basketball YouTuber versus the opinion of the former NBA superstar. Well the thing is, that thinking is flawed. Because it isn't just the opinion of Arenas versus mine, but it's the opinion of Arenas versus the opinions of NBA legends, like LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Dwight Howard, and Carmelo Anthony. All of those players who were better than Arenas thought it was worth their time to get private lessons from the dream in order to improve their game. In the cases of Kobe and LeBron, they sought out those private lessons after they had established themselves as MVPs and as an NBA champion. But again, don't listen to me, Kobe, and LeBron. Listen to the former star shot chucker who shot below league average efficiency from the field and from three throughout his career and never got past the second round of the playoffs. He's clearly the wise voice of basketball expertise that you all should listen to. Now listen, normally I don't go at a player or analyst this harshly, but the thing is, Arenas is one of those guys who's extremely disrespectful to former NBA players, and part of me wonders if he even believes the things he's saying, or if he's saying it just to bring attention to himself. If that's the case, then he certainly succeeded on that front. But the reality is, if a former player is gonna be saying some dumb stuff because he's a clout-seeking clown, then you best believe that I'm gonna call him a clown when it's time for me to share my take. I'm getting real tired of these disrespectful takes between older players and newer players in both directions. Without the older players, the game isn't as popular as it is today, affecting how well modern players are being paid. And without the newer players, all of the legends of the game just become forgotten has-beens from a league that's no longer popular or relevant. This negative energy towards each other is not something the game of basketball needs. But beyond the fact that he's being immensely disrespectful, he's also just flat out wrong on this take about Hakeem. And honestly, I think most of you guys in the comments will probably agree as well, whether you're young or old. I love the game of basketball, and I genuinely love discussing and comparing greats of the game to one another. But what I can't stand is when people do it in bad faith. Your favorite player and the player you think is the GOAT can be Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or LeBron James. Regardless of who your guy is, I can respect your stance. The only part that irritates me is when people are disingenuous with their arguments. How this usually manifests itself is that people will make absurd criticisms against the player who is in direct competition with their favorite player. Due to these biases, people will perpetuate specific critiques and narratives that honestly shouldn't carry any weight. Today, I'm breaking down three critiques that I can't stand from three of the greatest players of all time. First off, LeBron James and his 4-6 and six in the finals criticism. The fact that people try and turn this incredibly impressive achievement into a form of criticism is mind-boggling to me. 
LeBron James has four NBA championship rings and made it all the way to the NBA Finals on 10 different occasions, and with a total of three different franchises. As amazing as that sounds, it's the four and six part that gets regurgitated over and over again. The criticism implies that if LeBron only made it to the NBA Finals four times in his career and won all four times, that would be more impressive than his total of 10 appearances with four championships. Essentially, they're critiquing LeBron for making it too deep into the playoffs on six occasions, which is obviously ridiculous when you look at it objectively. The best example of why that critique is absurd is because of the 2007 postseason. At that point in LeBron's young career, he was only 22 years old, and he was leading the Cavaliers in the Eastern Conference Finals against the first-seeded Detroit Pistons. The Pistons were a team with championship experience and several All-Stars on their roster. This was the Pistons' fifth straight season where they had made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, and they were the heavy favorites heading into this series. What Detroit wasn't ready for was a young LeBron James who would perform in a way that was reminiscent of a prime Michael Jordan. In Game 5 especially, LeBron went absolutely nuts as he dropped 48 points, 9 rebounds, and 7 assists on 54.5% shooting, leading his Cavs in overtime to a 2-point victory. To say that James carried his team to victory would be a massive understatement, as LeBron scored the final 25 points for the Cleveland Cavaliers. In my opinion, this is one of the top three greatest playoff performances in NBA history, and it was done by a kid who wasn't even old enough to rent a car in most cases. The Cavaliers absolutely had no business beating the far more experienced Detroit Pistons that series, but thanks to LeBron's legendary performance, the Cavs were able to achieve the unthinkable. Now imagine using this performance as a criticism against LeBron's legacy. Sounds crazy, but that's exactly what people are doing when they mention the 4-6 narrative. Because LeBron's Cavs went on to lose in the NBA Finals against the dynastic San Antonio Spurs. By the logic of the 4-6 critique, it would have been better for his legacy if LeBron never dropped those 48 points, he never scored the Cavs final 25, and instead just laid over while the Pistons routed them out of the playoffs. Of course, that's stupid. So even if you're a Jordan guy, don't make this disingenuous critique and punish a player for something that should be appreciated. Speaking of which, next we're looking at Michael Jordan and the critique that he kept losing in the first round before Pippen showed up. Anytime anyone makes this criticism, I assume they did it either because they're so biased against Jordan that they ignore the truth, or because they're so young so they're obviously gonna be naive about the details of that era. Scottie Pippen wasn't drafted until the 87-88 season, which means that Jordan's first round critique is based on his first three seasons in the NBA, so let's take a look at those. MJ had one of the greatest rookie seasons of all time, as his regular season numbers appeared extremely similar to Kobe Bryant's lone MVP season. You could even argue that Jordan's numbers were better. A rookie Jordan improved the Bulls 11 wins over the previous season, and despite having no other All-Stars in the roster, he was able to carry them to the seventh seed in the Eastern Conference. The team they were going up against in the first round was an extremely stacked Milwaukee Bucks squad who had multiple All-Stars and who had won 59 games throughout the regular season. Along with their high-powered offense, the Bucks had the second best defense in the entire league. The leader of that defense was one of the greatest wing defenders of NBA history, Sidney Moncrief, who was in the prime of his career and is still the only guard in NBA history to win the Defensive Player of the Year award multiple times. Yes, a rookie Michael Jordan lost that series, but his clearly inferior squad was never expected to win in the first place, and despite being guarded by one of the greatest wing defenders of all time, he still had a pretty monstrous series on an individual level. Blaming Jordan for losing in the first round of 1985 would be ridiculous. Then we got a look at the next two seasons, 1986 and 1987. Once again, Jordan had monstrous seasons individually, but he was still the only all-star player on the Chicago Bulls. After breaking his foot early in the 1986 season, he went against the doctor's wishes and returned to action early and proceeded to drag his Bulls into the eight-seeded spot of the playoffs. 
Waiting for them in the first round was a team that some people still think is the greatest team in NBA history, the 1986 Boston Celtics. Most basketball historians agree that at the very least, these Celtics were a top five team of all time. They won 67 games throughout the regular season and had the best defense in the entire league. At that point, Jordan was the only Hall of Famer on the Bulls squad. The 1986 Celtics had five. Despite going up against one of the greatest teams and defenses of all time, Jordan averaged nearly 44 points, 6 rebounds, 6 assists, over 2 steals, and more than 1 block on over 50% shooting from the field. Included in that stat line was the greatest scoring performance in playoff history, when Jordan dropped 63 in Boston Garden. The highest scoring playoff performance of all time was against a number one ranked defense. Once again, blaming this first round loss on Jordan would be incredibly stupid. The next season, despite his weak supporting cast, Jordan improved the Bulls by 10 wins, but that still only landed them the eighth seed in the Eastern Conference. So waiting for them once again in the first round was the exact same super team Boston Celtics. Yet again, Jordan did his part, exploding statistically over the course of the series. But the Celtics' five Hall of Famers were clearly too much. These are the three first round exits before Pippen showed up, to a dominant 59 win Milwaukee Bucks team in his rookie season, and to one of the top five super teams of all time in 1986 and 1987. Back in the day, you would have been considered a fool to think that Jordan was going to beat any of those teams by himself. Yet some people today act like he should have done just that. The following season was Scotty's rookie year, but Pippen was a very slow bloomer and took time to develop his game both offensively and defensively. In the regular season of his rookie year, Pippen only averaged 8 points, 4 rebounds, and 2 assists in 20 minutes per game. Of course, this was the year the Bulls finally got past the first round. And according to the Jordan naysayers, it's not because Jordan averaged 45 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists, 3 steals, and 1.5 and blocks on 56% shooting over the course of the series. Certainly not. It was because Pippen arrived just in time to save the day off the bench, as he averaged 10 points in 27 minutes per game. Again, don't perpetuate this Jordan first round narrative. It makes you look like a filthy casual to those who actually know NBA history. Last on the list is Kobe Bryant and the critique that he blew a 3-1 lead in 2006 against the Suns. Kobe's 05-06 season is famous among basketball enthusiasts, and for good reason. It's the season where he scored 62 points and three quarters against that year's Western Conference champions, the Dallas Mavericks and is where he scored 81 points against the Toronto Raptors, which is still the second highest scoring performance of all time. In that regular season, Kobe averaged 35.4 points per game and was named first team all defense. That is still the highest scoring season ever for a player who also made first team all defense. In order to make the playoffs, this Herculean effort was required of Kobe as his roster was devoid of talent outside of Lamar Odom. Guys like Kwame Brown, Luke Walton, Chris Mim, and Smush Parker were consistently in the starting rotation. On most Western Conference teams, those same players would have struggled to get a roster spot. Regardless, Kobe led his Lakers to 45 wins throughout the regular season, which was good enough for the seventh seed in the Western Conference. Waiting for them in the first round of the playoffs was the far more talented and deeper Phoenix Suns. Heading into the series, the Lakers were considered as significant underdogs. Regardless, the first four games in the series ended up being extremely close, where each contest could have gone either way. In Game 4 especially, Kobe provided late game heroics, and with his iconic game-winning buzzer beater, the Lakers took an improbable 3-1 lead in the series. Now did the Lakers go on to lose the series? Absolutely. But unlike say the Golden State Warriors in 2016, the Lakers weren't these massive favorites heading into the series and were basically playing with house money. Before the series, no one thought the Lakers would ever get up 3-1 in the first place. So when the Lakers went on to lose the next three games against Phoenix, not many of us were actually surprised by that because we knew how lucky the Lakers were to get up 3-1. 
The other reason why I think the blowing a 3-1 lead critique is absurd is because Kobe had likely the best playoff game of his career in Game 6. Down the stretch, Kobe was consistently hitting insanely tough shots that the Lakers absolutely had to have. And on the night, he finished the game with 50 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3 steals on a stellar 66.4 true shooting percentage. The Lakers should have won that game as well. The Lakers were up by 3 points with only seconds left in regulation, but Los Angeles consistently blew opportunities to secure the loose ball and the defensive rebound. And as a result, Tim Thomas hits a 3 to tie the game, which sends it to overtime. If the Lakers secure that rebound, they win the series, and Kobe is being praised as a hero for one of the greatest playoff performances of all time. But because Lamar Odom didn't box out for that board, the Lakers go on to lose, and Kobe is blamed for blowing a 3-1 lead. Isn't it crazy how one moment completely unconnected to the superstar player can decide the narrative about that superstar player? There is the highly debated topic about Kobe quitting in Game 7, which I personally don't believe he did, which involves an in-depth explanation and will eventually get its own video. Point being, Kobe didn't blow the series based on his play in the final three games, and the Lakers were never considered the better team in the first place. So to critique him for quote, blowing a 3-1 lead, seems a little unfair when you consider the circumstances of that series. A couple videos ago, I talked about a few critiques that drive me insane. I broke down what I believe are ridiculous and misleading narratives about some of the greatest players of all time. Honestly, most of that video was me simply defending these legends for some of the weaker critiques thrown against them. Now with that being said, no basketball player is perfect, and every athlete has some weaknesses. So today, I'm looking at those same three NBA legends and breaking down what I believe are the actual legitimate criticisms of their careers. First off, LeBron James and the 2011 NBA Finals. After trying to win a championship for seven years in Cleveland, LeBron shook the basketball world by joining Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh in Miami. Immediately, the expectations were extremely high, but LeBron didn't do himself any favors when predicting at least eight championships prior to the season starting. The comment from LeBron did come across like it was a bit tongue-in-cheek. But regardless, the narrative was being established early on that a healthy Miami team would have no excuses for failing to win a championship. Despite their talent, the Heat got off to a rocky start, opening the season with a 9-8 record. It was soon after that where they began to hit their stride, and they eventually finished the regular season with a 58-24 record. They cruised their way to the NBA Finals, winning the first round, the second round, and the Eastern Conference Finals in five games apiece. With the Dallas Mavericks standing in their path, the Heat were now sitting as the clear favorites to win the NBA championship. If LeBron played at a level even remotely close to his usual expectations, then Miami likely wins that series. As you all know, that's not what happened though. At times, he almost appeared as if he was afraid of the moment and was scared to shoot the basketball. Regardless of his reluctance, he still found a way to lead all players in turnovers over the course of the series. In those finals, LeBron averaged a disappointing 17.8 points, 7.2 rebounds, and 6.8 assists on 47.8% shooting. His worst performance came in Game 4, which was a very winnable game for Miami, as Dallas won with a final score of 86-83. On the night, LeBron played nearly 46 minutes of the game, and he finished with only 8 points on 3 of 11 shooting from the field. At the time I'm currently making this video, LeBron is on a streak of 1,151 regular season games with at least 10 points, which is easily the longest streak in NBA history. This streak began well before the 2011 NBA Finals. The fact that LeBron is actively on such a remarkable streak makes it even more mind-blowing that he managed to score only 8 points in an NBA Finals game where they could have easily taken a 3-1 lead in the series. No matter how long James plays, regardless of his impressive stats, and regardless of what he accomplishes before he retires, this ugly moment of his career will always be a part of his legacy. Kobe Bryant and the 2004 NBA Finals. 
As someone who closely followed the career of the Mamba, I'm actually quite surprised by how rarely he's criticized for this series, as I believe is the biggest stain on his basketball career. I'm not mincing words when I say that Kobe Bryant was the biggest reason the Lakers lost this series, other than the simple fact that Detroit was a really great team. Before I get into what Kobe did that sabotaged his own team's chances, let me first provide a little bit of context. The Lakers began the 2003-2004 season with their major acquisitions of Carl Malone and Gary Payton. Although both of these stars were in the twilight of their careers, they were still performing at an all-star level when the Lakers signed them. With now four stars in Los Angeles' starting lineup, many people were predicting these Lakers to challenge the Bulls' 72-10 record. It was also understood amongst the team that in order to be successful, sacrifices would have to be made, as these stars would have to share the basketball with one another. With that being said, the season ended up being much rockier than originally expected. Throughout the regular season, the beef between Kobe and Shaq had reached an all-time high of toxicity, as both players began taking subtle jabs at one another through media interviews. On top of that, each player's ego was being challenged consistently by one another, as both players strongly desired to be known as the leader of the Lakers. Through all of the drama and the chemistry issues, the Lakers still managed to finish the regular season with a solid 56-26 record. Yet considering their preseason expectations, that record almost felt like a disappointment. The Lakers fought and clawed their way to the NBA Finals, where the defensively dominant Detroit Pistons were waiting. But at that point, the Lakers were still considered the favorites in the matchup. Now understand, at this time in history, most people in the basketball community still saw Shaq as the engine that drove the Lakers. One of the major reasons for this was the fact that Shaq had won the finals MVP in all three of their title runs, while Kobe simply observed during the ceremony. Given their massive ego battle, Kobe presumably wanted his own finals MVP. If he was going to assert himself as the man in Los Angeles over O'Neal, then Kobe was likely going to need to win the finals MVP to sway the narrative in his favor. So when Game 1 started in Los Angeles, Kobe immediately started playing as if all he cared about was the finals MVP. As a close spectator of that series, I can testify to the fact that the Mamba wasn't playing within the flow of the team's offense, and was forcing up shot after shot. You don't have to take my word for it, take the word of one of Kobe's former teammates. At the time, the Lakers backup shooting guard was a young player named Kareem Rush. In May of the year 2020, Rush said in an interview that Kobe quote, selfishly wanted the MVP. He was really itching to get that MVP, and we got caught off guard by a better team. Game 1 was all the heads up you need on how this series was going to play out. Kobe took 27 shots in the first game and only converted 37% of them, while Shaq made 13 of his far fewer 16 field goal attempts, which is 81.3% from the field. On the series as a whole, Kobe took 29 more shots than Shaquille O'Neal, despite the fact that the Mamba was only shooting 38.1% while Shaq was making 63.1% of his shots. To me, this is the worst criticism of Kobe's career, and a completely justified one at that, as he put his own selfish desires ahead of what was best for the team. And instead of changing course when it clearly wasn't working, Kobe just kept forcing it up throughout the entirety of the series. If it wasn't for his immaturity in this series, who knows, maybe he would have retired with six rings on his fingers instead of five. Next up, Michael Jordan and the 1995 playoffs. The thing that bothers me the most about this semifinal series is the fact that the biggest Jordan stands pretend that it never happened. Yes, Michael Jordan went 6-0 in the NBA Finals, but it's not like he never lost after he started winning championships in 1991. Once again, let me provide some context. The Chicago Bulls had won three straight championships from 1991 to 1993, and after the tragic passing of his father, that offseason, Jordan felt inspired to leave the game of basketball and begin his career as a baseball player. Due to this, Michael Jordan was completely absent from the 93-94 NBA season. Regardless, his Chicago Bulls were still very competitive, as they won 55 games throughout the regular season, and even made it as far as the Eastern Conference semifinals. But the following season, the Bulls were struggling, 
Meanwhile, Jordan's itch to return to basketball was becoming too strong for him to resist, and with only 17 games left in the regular season, MJ made his return to a Bulls team with a 34-31 record. Jordan's first game back was rough, as they lost to the Indiana Pacers while Jordan shot 7 of 28 from the field. He wouldn't appear rusty for very long though. In his fifth game back, Jordan dropped 55 points on the New York Knicks while shooting 56.8% from the field. Instantly, people were believing that the Bulls were championship contenders once again. After getting past the first round of the playoffs, they were matched up against the first seeded Orlando Magic, who were bolstering a three-headed monster of Shaquille O'Neal, Penny Hardaway, and Jordan's former teammate, Horace Grant. The Bulls went on to lose game one, and the manner in which they did it was what stung the most. With only 18 seconds left in the fourth quarter, the Bulls were up by one point, seemingly in a commanding position of the game. Unfortunately for MJ, he had one of the most unclutch moments of his career, as he blindly had the ball stolen from him by Nick Anderson, which led to a fast break dunk by Horace Grant, securing the lead for Orlando. With a chance to redeem himself with late game heroics, Michael Jordan turned the ball over yet again with a bad pass intended for Scottie Pippen. On the night, Jordan had 19 points on 8 of 22 shooting and a whopping 8 turnovers. This was a crucial game where the Bulls could have stolen home court advantage from Orlando right out of the gates. The thing is, after this performance in games 2 through 6, Jordan was basically his old self, as he put up monstrous averages of 33.4 points, 6.8 rebounds, and 3.8 assists on 49.6% shooting. With that being said, the Bulls ultimately still lost the series in 6 games. If I'm being honest, this was my least favorite part of the Last Dance documentary, because for this entire segment, it was basically Jordan and his physical trainer making excuses for why they lost the series. The biggest excuse was that Jordan wasn't in basketball shape and was still in his baseball shape. The thing is, this wasn't the narrative when Jordan was dropping 55 in Madison Square Garden. When Jordan was putting up these numbers in games 2 through 6 against Orlando, he didn't look like a baseball player. He was performing at the same level of greatness that he was accustomed to. The truth is, the Bulls didn't lose because of Jordan's baseball excuse. They lost because they no longer had an inside presence like they did in their first three-peat. Horace Grant was now on the other side of the court, averaging 18 points and 11 rebounds on 65% shooting for the Orlando Magic. No matter how much Jordan, his trainer, and the Jordan stands want to act like this series didn't count, it did. They were simply beat by the better team, and when Jordan had the opportunity to steal a crucial game in Orlando, he choked, plain and simple. The funny thing is, even if Jordan's baseball excuse was the reason the Bulls lost the series, that's still not a legitimate excuse, because that's no one's fault other than his own. He was the one who decided to come back to basketball with only 17 games left in the regular season. The Orlando Magic didn't make him do that, so don't try to invalidate their victory. And just like how Jordan ignored the fact that Horace Grant was the real reason they lost in 95, the Last Dance doc also failed to mention that Horace Grant got injured in Game 1 of the 1996 series where the Bulls executed their revenge. At that moment, Grant was lost for the rest of the series. Now don't get me wrong, I still think a 72-10 Bulls would have beat a 64-win Orlando Magic team even with a healthy Horace Grant. But at the very least, if you're going to go on about your excuses for your loss in 1995, then don't ignore the excuses of the other team in 96. If your favorite player is Michael Jordan, my bit of advice is just take the L on the 1995 series. You personally can still view MJ as the greatest player of all time, while acknowledging that at least one time after he began his championship reign in the NBA, he and the Bulls legitimately failed to get it done. My heart behind making this video is to show that there is ways to legitimately criticize even the greatest players of all time. But hopefully, this video also serves as an encouraging reminder that it's always possible to bounce back from monumental failures, as all three of these incredible legends went on to achieve amazing things after their significant failures. Recently, Scottie Pippen had a birthday and turned 58 years old, and on social media was tons of people giving their perspectives on his career and legacy. 
The thing is, in this current day of basketball discussions, it's so hard to get an honest perspective on the value and impact of Scottie Pippen. And let's just point out the elephant in the room. It's obviously because of the tired debate of Jordan versus LeBron. As much as I hate it, unfortunately, this seemingly never-ending debate has influenced and permeated just about every corner of basketball conversations. Some Jordan fans have an agenda to minimize Pippen's impact, in an attempt to make Jordan appear even greater. And on the other hand, some LeBron fans try to elevate Pippen's greatness to the point that he was basically an equal to Jordan in an attempt to diminish MJ's success. As a grown man who thinks tying your emotional state to a basketball player is pretty pathetic, my only agenda with this video is to give an honest and hopefully insightful perspective on Pippen that will result in plenty of views and help me get my new truck. So without further ado, let's get into it. Over the last couple of days, I've been seeing one specific Pippen quote from 2015 circling the internet all over again. He said, I was LeBron before LeBron. They want to compare him to the greatest, whether it's MJ or Magic, but he's closer to myself. It's important to keep in mind that Pippen made this comment eight years ago, which was before LeBron's third championship in Cleveland and long before his fourth championship in Los Angeles. So Pippen's perspective on this comparison may have changed since then. As far as his comparison to LeBron, I can see it in a sense, stylistically. Both players were big and long physically gifted athletes who were tremendous threats in transition. But the most apt comparison is probably the aspect of the point forward. Despite the fact that both of these stars played primarily at the small forward position, both of them were known to be the main facilitators of their squads. But that's about the point where the comparison ends for me. Unlike LeBron and Jordan, Pippen was a bit of a slow bloomer, as he only averaged 7 points per game in his rookie season, and didn't start a single game that year. He didn't clearly establish himself as the Bulls' second best player until his third year in the NBA, which was the 1989-1990 season. Along with that, Pippen also developed slowly as an offensive player, as he didn't average at least 20 points per game until his fifth season in the league, which was during their second championship run in 1992. This brings me to my next observation that people sometimes fail to recognize. Pippen was somewhat limited offensively. Without question, he was one of the greatest two-way players in basketball history. But in no way, shape, or form would I ever consider Pippen as an elite scorer. He was a great slasher and became a decent three-point shooter as his career went on. But he didn't have the best dribbling skills, he wasn't fantastic with his back to the basket, and he sometimes struggled to reliably make a play for himself. With Jordan on the roster, at his best, Pippen scored 21 points per game. And when Jordan retired in 1993, many people expected Pippen to then assert himself as an elite scorer with extra opportunities. Well, that didn't end up being the case. Pippen's scoring did go up without MJ, but it was only marginal, as he went from roughly a 20 points per game score to 22 points per game in 1994 and 1995. I remember in the Last Dance documentary, Phil Jackson referred to Pippen as possibly the second best player in the entire league, only behind Jordan. But that seemed like a crazy claim to me. During his prime, I don't remember people considering Pippen as a better player than Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, Patrick Ewing, Hakeem Olajuwon, David Robinson, and so on. Pippen was one of those guys who did almost everything well. He scored well, he facilitated well, and he defended well. But without being an elite league-leading scorer, he seemed to always be held back from being in the conversation of the best players in the league. Now is that fair? Personally, I think so. Ask yourself this, how many players are referred to as superstars that never got close to averaging 25 points per game? Some facilitators might, but they're usually playmakers on another level entirely, like Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas. So maybe Pippen gets a little overpraised at times as an offensive player, but what he doesn't get praised for enough is his all-time great defense. There is a debate on who's the better defensive player, Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen. Personally, I think it depends on how you look at it. 
Michael was more of a risk taker. He was the defender who was more likely to leave his man in an attempt to trap the offensive player with a double team. He would also often sneak up on the shooter as the help defender attempting to block his shot. Michael was more likely to abandon his man in an attempt to jump the passing lane and get the steal. When it worked, Jordan looked amazing, but when it didn't, the Bulls usually allowed a basket because of it. On the other hand, Pippen wasn't as much of a risk taker. Instead of daringly trying to force turnovers as often as MJ did, Pippen usually just locked up the opposing player with his smothering on-ball defense. With his lateral speed and remarkable hustle, Pippen's greatest gift defensively was his ability to stay in front of the offensive player at all times, often forcing them into a more difficult shot. The fact that he never won the Defensive Player of the Year award is kind of ridiculous, as he was consistently seen as the standard of excellence for wing defense. So if you ask me, was Pippen the LeBron before LeBron? I don't think so, as he was too limited offensively to earn that title. Was he ever close to being the second best player in the NBA? Again, I also don't think so as players like Karl Malone, Hakeem Olajuwon, and David Robinson were elite defenders while being in the race for the scoring lead, which is something that Pippen could only dream of. On the other hand, it's a travesty that Jordan won a Defensive Player of the Year during his career, but Pippen did not. Because in terms of pure on-ball defense, I believe Pippen was definitely the best on their first three championship squads. So was Pippen the kind of player who you would consider as a franchise-leading superstar, who could have been the best player on a championship team? Honestly, I don't believe so, but he was the perfect teammate to Michael Jordan. In the exact areas where Michael needed help is the areas where Pippen was strong, like defense and distributing. Because Scotty was able to handle so much of the other responsibilities on the court, Jordan was able to focus so much of his energy on dominating the game with his scoring. A good example of that would be their averages during their playoff runs in their six championships. In those playoff runs, Pippen averaged more rebounds, more assists, more steals, and more blocks, while MJ obviously scored way more points. Like on most things, the truth lies somewhere in between. Pippen was a vital aspect of the Bulls winning six championships, and MJ certainly couldn't have done it without him. But due to his limited abilities as a scorer, he shouldn't be elevated to the level of a top three player in the league, or being compared to LeBron James. That's simply too much in the opposite direction. One of the most annoying aspects about the basketball community in general is how we all act like we're definitive experts on every topic related to the game. Our ego gets in the way and doesn't let us acknowledge areas where we might not be the most knowledgeable. You never hear anyone say, you know, I didn't watch 80s basketball, so I might not have the most insightful take. You never hear anyone say, you know, I only watch the NBA, so it's not really my place to criticize the Euro League. That kind of humility and self-awareness is extremely rare. I can admit that I also have areas where I need to study up. For example, I hear people occasionally talk about Oscar Schmidt, and I'm not really too familiar with his game. Another example is Arvita Sabonis. I remember him as an aging Portland Trailblazer, and I know he was a tremendous player overseas. But honestly, it's not like I've watched a lot of Sabonis Euroball before he was in the NBA. You're probably better suited asking someone from Lithuania or Spain just how good he was. But again, most people are not willing to admit the areas where they could learn more about the game. And because of this, I regularly see people making crazy and outlandish statements, which are clear bits of evidence that they actually didn't witness what they are talking about. Today, I have a few aspects of NBA history that you just cannot fully comprehend unless you actually saw it. And I also have a couple suggestions on what to watch if you want to become more enlightened on those aspects. So without further ado, let's get into it. First off, the dominance of prime Shaquille O'Neal. Draymond Green famously made comments that he could give Shaq some problems, and now, because of his ridiculous delusion, I regularly see posts like this circling around social media. 
Sure, there is the narrative that Dennis Rodman and Ben Wallace put the clamps on Shaquille O'Neal, but that's just not true. Here are Shaq's career averages, and these are his career averages specifically against Dennis Rodman and Ben Wallace. At best, they did a decent job of containing Shaq, but absolutely no one can put the clamps on the diesel. In all of my years of watching the game of basketball, I've never seen anyone impose his will to the degree that Shaq did. Every once in a while, it does irk me when people refer to Shaq as the most dominant player to ever play because newsflash, Will Chamberlain once existed. With that being said, I kinda get it from a certain perspective. Shaq's dominance wasn't just about scoring points over the opposing player, but it was his unparalleled bullying nature. The seven foot one inch, 325 pound diesel was not a gentle giant in the slightest. He would use his strength, his shoulders, his elbows, and his sheer ruthlessness to dunk over the top of opposing centers. He made real-life giants look like junior varsity players by how he overpowered them. Occasionally, they adapted and tried to flop, but Shaq would learn from that and sometimes held back on the punishing contact while the defender flailed backwards and had an uncontested dunk at the rim as a result. Listen, there have been other all-time great scoring bigs in NBA history, like Kareem, Hakeem, and Wilt, but none of them did it like Shaq did, as each of those other centers relied more on the finesse aspect of their game. During his prime, everyone knew the ball was getting dumped down to Shaq repeatedly. General managers knew it, and they built teams with the intent to slow him down. The opposing head coach knew it, and he game-planned for it. The analysts in the pregame knew it and discussed it at length. The millions of people watching the telecast knew it, the 20,000 people in the stadium knew it, and the centers assigned to guard him knew it as well. Yet when tip-off came, there was still nothing they could do to stop it. That should be the very definition of dominance. If you want to witness this yourself, I would watch the first two games of the 2000 NBA Finals. Pay attention to how Shaq imposes his will. Pay attention to how he controls the pace of the game and even controls the opposing team's rotations. Watch how he gets numerous players in foul trouble and how he simultaneously opens up the floor for his three-point shooting teammates. He was truly one of a kind and honestly, I don't think I'll see a player like him ever again. Next up, the pace of play in the late 1990s you really had to watch full-length games in that era to comprehend just how slow the style and pace of play was during those days. So I was on social media and I saw this post that said the greatest team Jordan ever faced scored 54 points in a finals game. Like at some point, we gotta be serious about this stuff. Obviously, this is a ridiculous argument centered around LeBron and Jordan fans. Honestly, I don't care which side of the debate you're on. You're welcome on my channel. But what I do care about is the integrity of the argument. First off, calling the 98 Jazz, quote, the greatest team Jordan ever faced is either the most ignorant comment I've ever heard or is the most biased lie that I've ever heard. In the playoffs, Jordan did go up against super teams like the 1986 Celtics and the 1989 Pistons. Heck, I even think the 93 Suns and the 96 Sonics were much better than the 98 Jazz. But enough about this ridiculous statement. Let's focus on the aspect of 54 points. Nowhere in this post is there any credit given to Jordan and the Bulls' defense. It's simply that the Jazz sucked, which is obviously a way of twisting the argument in his favor. It also needs to be said that 54 points is not built the same as 54 points in the modern era. In the most recent NBA season, teams were averaging 114.7 points per game, which is literally the highest yearly average since the 1960s. In 1998, teams were averaging 95.6 points, which is nearly 20 points less. In 2023, teams averaged 88.3 shots per game, and 34.7 three-point attempts per game, compared to 1998, where teams shot the ball 79.6 times and took roughly a third of the three-point attempts. But here's the thing, that was just the regular season numbers. 
The Bulls and Jazz were two older veteran teams who especially loved to play in half-court sets. When these two teams met up, the pace was comically slower when compared to the modern era. In the 98 Finals, the Bulls averaged 75.5 shots per game, and the Jazz averaged 71.8. Between both teams, you're talking about nearly 40 less shots per game and nearly 50 less three-point attempts. Of course, that kind of point total wouldn't be possible in the modern game, because the game is played with a completely different style. To further prove that it's about the eras rather than the quality of players, consider how LeBron freaking James was on the Cavaliers on December 2nd, 2006, and that team only scored a grand total of 63 points against the Houston Rockets. And again, that was eight years later, when general offensive averages had picked up a bit. If you go watch literally any game from the 1998 NBA Finals, you'll see that the pace of play was insanely slow in comparison, as the Jazz never eclipsed 90 points, and the Bulls only scored over 90 twice. Honestly, unless you're a hardcore basketball fan who loves the nuance of the game, you'll probably find every game in the 98 Finals extremely boring throughout. But that's how the game was played in that era and drawing massive conclusions about a player or a team's greatness simply because they scored significantly less points is one of the most ignorant assumptions that someone can make. Last on the list is the Showtime Lakers offense. When I say this next segment is a change of pace, I mean that, literally. The Magic Johnson-led Lakers offense was absurdly fast, and I really don't think you'll grasp it until you watch them play at length. Sure, occasionally they would slow things down and feed the ball to Kareem in the post, but the bread and butter of their offense was their insane tempo. I've never seen a team insist on making the game an exhilarating pace as much as that Lakers team did. Most teams look to start a fast break based on how the defense is positioned and based on whether or not they have the numbers. But in many cases, Magic and the Lakers didn't even consider that and simply forced a fast break off the rebound because that was the game plan. To many people, this is why they see Magic Johnson as the greatest passer in NBA history, because he had to constantly make split-second decisions with pinpoint accuracy. Otherwise, it would result in a turnover. Most point guards and most other great passers of NBA history didn't have that level of pressure on them on a nightly basis. If you want to see what I'm talking about, I would watch Game 1 and Game 2 of the 1987 NBA Finals. At that time, the rivaled Boston Celtics were one of the slowest half-court teams in the entire league, and that series is a perfect example of the Lakers forcing another team to play at a tempo that they didn't want to. Let me start off this video by acknowledging the purple and gold elephant in the room. I am a lifelong Lakers fan, and I have made it very clear numerous times on my channel that Kobe Bryant is my favorite player of all time. So although I don't think I'm being biased with this opinion, it's still entirely possible. Maybe it's my own subconscious bias that's inspiring me to get this point across. But again, I don't think so. On this channel, in front of thousands of listeners, I've been critical of Kobe numerous times. For example, I believe his selfish Finals MVP aspirations was the biggest reason the Lakers lost in the 2004 NBA Finals. I believe the Lakers making Kobe the highest paid player in the league after he tore his Achilles and was his mid-30s was one of the dumbest decisions the organization has ever made. And I also believe that Kobe's final three seasons after his Achilles tear was some of the ugliest basketball I have ever seen from a superstar player as he shot only 36.6% in those last three seasons, while being among the league leaders in shot attempts per game. Fortunately, his 60-point farewell game kind of washed away the memory of just how bad those final three seasons were. So like I said before, although Kobe Bryant is my favorite player of all time, I at least try to be as objective as possible when talking about the game of basketball in general. So now for the topic at hand, Many people, and maybe even the majority of people who watch basketball, believe that Kobe Bryant quit on his team in Game 7 of the first round in the 2006 playoffs against the Phoenix Suns. 
The reason people believe this is because Kobe was publicly frustrated with the Lakers organization at this time, due to the lack of a solid supporting cast. Heading into the second half of Game 7, the Lakers were down by 15 points. And in the second half, Kobe was extremely passive and seemed reluctant to shoot the ball. After taking 13 shots in the first half, Kobe only took a total of three shots in the second half, and the Lakers ended up losing the deciding seventh game by a whopping 31 points. Given the fact that Kobe was a natural volume shooter, it seemed incredibly out of character for him to be so passive in the second half of a crucial game. So because of this, a narrative was firmly established that Kobe quit on his team in Game 7 of those playoffs. And it's a narrative that still regularly circulates in basketball discussions to this very day. Now for myself personally, I don't believe this narrative in the slightest, and I never have for that matter. As someone who watched every Laker game that season, I believe there is a legitimate reason why things played out the way that they did but it requires the full context of that season. So if there's any video of mine that you watch till the very end, I ask that you would make it this one. So let's get into it. Like I mentioned before, back in my teenage years, I religiously watched every single Laker game. And I mean every single Laker game. If people ask me to go out to dinner, sorry, I can't, there's a Laker game tonight. Friends invited me to a youth group event, sorry, I can't, there's a Laker game tonight. The girl I had a crush on invited me to her place. I would love to tomorrow, but there's a Laker game tonight. So with that being said, I vividly remember the themes and the talking points throughout that season. One of the themes was this. When Kobe wasn't scoring as much and he got his teammates involved, the Lakers tended to win games more often. This was a constant talking point during the Lakers pregame telecasts. Back then, on the Lakers local broadcast on Fox Sports Net, they had a pregame segment called Philosophy 101. It was a consistent pregame event where the Lakers head coach Phil Jackson was being interviewed by Bill McDonald before he was the Lakers official play-by-play -play commentator. Throughout the season, Phil was constantly preaching about the Lakers' need to get Kobe's teammates going as well. Although Kobe averaged 35.4 points per game that season, Phil Jackson understood that the Lakers' best recipe for success was to play a free-flowing team game. And to be honest, this has always been a major coaching tactic throughout Phil Jackson's career, as the triangle offense is one that requires plenty of ball movement, and one player constantly scoring in isolation plays is a disruption to that offense. In 1989, when Phil Jackson replaced Doug Collins as the head coach of the Chicago Bulls, he asked Michael Jordan to decrease his scoring and share the basketball more in order to win more basketball games. In 2003, when Kobe scored 40 points in 9 straight games, Phil asked Kobe to put an end to that streak so they could get Shaquille O'Neal more involved in the offense. And again, in 2006, Phil was constantly telling Kobe that he needed to trust his teammates more in order for them to be successful. And you know what? Based on the evidence we have from the Lakers' 05-06 season, Phil Jackson was right. When it came to Kobe scoring, there was a sweet spot for the Lakers that season. Phil Jackson knew this, the Lakers broadcast crew knew this, and I, as a frequently spectating Lakers fan, came to learn this. In the 05-06 regular season, in games where Kobe scored 27-34 points, the Lakers had a remarkable 15-3 record. This was a Lakers team that finished as a 7th seed in the NBA playoffs. Yet when Kobe was scoring in this points range, the Lakers were winning at the rate of a first-seeded team. Now on the other hand, in games where Kobe scored 35-42 points, the Lakers had a disappointing 13-15 record. That's quite the contrast between the two different approaches. The coaching staff understood that when the Lakers played a natural flowing team game, they were pretty successful. But when it was all about isolation plays in the Kobe show, they were struggling just to be a team above 500. Obviously, if Kobe's gonna score 81 points or 62 points in just three quarters, the Lakers are going to win those games. But if Kobe is going to have a game where he scores merely 40 points, then it would have been better for him to score only 30 while keeping his teammates involved. This wasn't just a theme of the Lakers regular season, but this theme carried over into the playoffs against the Phoenix Suns. 
After the first four games in this playoff series, the Lakers had a commanding 3-1 lead over Phoenix. The thing is, Kobe wasn't looking to score very much as the Lakers were dominating the Suns, as he averaged only 23 points per game over the course of the first four games. Now games 5 and 6 were a totally different approach. In those games, Kobe averaged a ridiculously efficient 39.5 points per game. In those two games, he was hitting 57.7% of his shots, and 50% from three-point range. Yet the Lakers still lost both of those games. Up to the point of Game 7, this theme had been consistent throughout the entirety of the season. The Lakers coaching staff knew this, and Kobe Bryant knew this. When Game 7 started, Kobe continued his scoring onslaught, trying to will his team to the second round with his scoring ability. There was only one problem though. At the end of the first half, Kobe had 23 points on 61.5% shooting, yet his Lakers were still losing by 15 points. At this pace, with this current tactic, Kobe is going to have another game where he scores over 40 points, but his Lakers are going to lose by 30. Kobe's shoot first, pass second strategy wasn't working. It didn't work throughout the regular season, it didn't work in games 5 and 6, and it certainly wasn't working in the first half of game 7. So when Kobe came out in the second half of game 7 looking to pass the ball, I didn't see a player who was quitting on his team by being passive. No, I saw a player who knew that what he was doing up to this point wasn't working, so he tried the exact opposite. I saw Kobe who was desperately trying to get his teammates going because he knew that it was the only shot he had at defeating the Phoenix Suns. Now obviously, this tactic didn't work either, as Kobe's teammates only shot 33.3% from the field in the second half, and the Lakers ended up losing by 31 points. Now here's the thing, this wasn't just my observation after watching Game 7. But this is pretty close to Phil Jackson's and Kobe Bryant's explanation of what actually happened. Take a listen. Well, you know, we wanted to get back in the ball game. We run stuff through other guys. Nash was a little bit banged up. We're trying to, you know, work at that end of it, trying to go inside to Lamar, get an inside out game. And, uh, you know, Kobe just sat on that game and let the other things happen. And Explain your approach to the second half. You only took a couple of shots. Well, I mean, if we're going to get back in this type of a game, um, we have to have everybody contributing. You know, in the first half, um, started, you know, picking it up offensively just to keep us in the hunt. In the second half, when we're going to get back in these type of games, everybody starts getting in the rhythm. Then everybody gets pumped up about the game. Uh, just didn't happen for us. So now you're trying to tell me that Kobe freaking Bryant, one of the most driven, hardworking, and competitive athletes in human history, just laid over and accepted defeat? Are you serious? Kobe is one of the last people that I could ever envision doing that, based on his personality and his reputation. Guys like that don't just lay over and quit due to pettiness. For me, it's way harder to believe that a highly competitive person made a complete out of character action by quitting on his team than it is for me to believe that Kobe being passive was his desperate attempt to give his team a chance at winning the game. But at the end of the day, that's just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.